Hello and welcome into the Section 109 podcast. <laughs> Cheers, my dears. Cheers, bud. It is a uh, time of the year that I love. It is the chance to preview the season. Do a little roster preview. I'm here in Studio Breezy with Sir Mix-a-Lot, Matthew, Baba Juan. Uh, Toby is hiding somewhere. I think he's had tummy ache today, so hopefully he will uh, be okay during the podcast. And we're here to talk all things preview. Now, you might be going, Breezy, you moron. We are four we, or four games, including three league games. Is that the right math? Into the season already. Three league games three and, league, one, okay. and one other game that mattered. I, I said that, and then what, what, what other game? I don't think there was another game. Um, but we now are here to preview because we didn't have time and we didn't have a full roster. But now, based on some Instagram sleuthing, uh, it certainly looks... Like the final signing to arrive in town is in training now. Therefore, we're here to do a preview and with a little bit of uh, the benefit of knowing a little bit of how we've played these first few weeks. So, Matthew, uh, what's your vibe check? How you feeling? We have a game uh, this weekend. Um, how you feeling? Uh, we have a game this weekend, so the vibes are already good. Uh, I had a good week at work. Do you think Messi is going to play this week? No, he's not. So what you're? I'm si- not sure if he's ever going to play again, based on how he played in the uh, in the Concacaf Champions Cup against Monterey. Are you guessing that Messi might be um, scared to play on a war 80 degrees day at Finley Stadium? <laughs> I mean, I don't really know what's going on there, uh, but no, he definitely will not be playing against CFC for the the two team. I suspect. Uh, well, part of that two team was made the bench against Monterey, so they're. Uh, Did they lose? Oh, it was bad. It was real bad. Uh, they were down two one on aggregate, uh, and Messi didn't play in, in the in the first leg in Miami. Excuse me, in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, and, how dare you? <laughs> uh, and they went they went down to Monterey with big expectations. It was. Uh, Miami's pretty pretty banged up injury wise. Um, well, they're also ninety years old, average age. Yeah, that's before you get to to all the old players. Um, and 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 they just went down there, and uh, Drake Calendar makes a, a really really bad mistake to give away a goal. Um, Seems bad. Not not too dissimilar. It was a it was a misplaced pass that was picked off for an empty net goal, uh, but not too dis- dissimilar circumstances to to Patrick Schulte the night before giving away a goal for Columbus against Tigres. Uh, and that put him down uh, a one nil pretty early. I will say like that goal doesn't change the game necessarily because Miami always needed to score two goals. Right. Cause there are still away goals in contract right. champions. League. In, in, in the first 90 minutes, there are away goals, away goals goal will go away after uh, you move to extra time. So Miami always had to score two this time after that goal goes in, it's to score two to stay alive versus score two to be able to win. And, uh, and like they, they had, they had some chances, they had some, some whatever, but they gave up too many, they gave it, gave up too much action to Monterey. Um, and they, they missed a, they missed a really good chance at the end of the first half to be able to level things. Uh, but like Miami's got problems right now and MLS has problems because of they, they had announced some new roster, some mid season roster rules, which are good and will help. Uh, and and it's also all they yeah. Could, what the fuck do those mean? It's also all they can really do mid season because um, you you can't change things mid season that that much. Uh, I mean, this is going to go down a rabbit hole, but we can we can talk about the well. Roster. Well, here's here's my question: Is are any? Do you think any of these roster rules go over them real quick? Um, because unfortunately, we're going to be like <laughs> it matters now. Yeah. Well, and I'm just curious. Like, do you think any of them are going to have an effect on us and MLS Next Pro as like a a kicker down the line? Well, you know, I'm scrolling through here and we're just It's an ESPN article, I think. I believe I don't so last I saw ESPN released something I'll, and it I'll was basically I'll do the athletic article cuz that's the one I've seen before. Okay. So what ESPN basically said is like they're going to make changes to the young DP rule essentially and the regular DP rule, but it didn't say what they were going to be uh, last I saw. So, okay. Let's hit the quick hitters on this. Uh Biggest rule change is that uh, as of right ne- uh, as of today, because this is not actually approved yet, they'll have to go to the Players Association to get the approval for midseason. 
Uh, as of today, teams with three senior designated players, which are three players that occupy roster spots that do not get calculated beyond yes. a max the, budget charge in the salary cap in in the actual salary cap, uh, they can those teams can own, with three senior DPS can only have one U twenty two player. A U twenty two player is a player that U twenty two DP like a young DP. No, that's different as well. Fuck MLS. U twenty two specifically is a player uh, that cannot whose salary cannot rise above a certain threshold every year, but whose acquisition costs are not included in their budget charge. The amortization of their of their yeah. Um, so like so and, 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 and I hate MLS. So and the much. way they do that is it, the original rules were said. If you want three old superstars, knock yourself out, but you only get one of these young deep, you know, young like U twenty two players, which you can acquire for five million dollars, but you can't pay them more than I don't know, like five hundred thousand, whatever it is. Uh, and 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 the theory then being, go out and go recruit some young future potential superstars, and then sell them on, recoup your money. Uh, they just can't make a certain amount of money. Uh, they are decoupling that. So you can have, uh, under the new rules, you can have either three designated players and three U22 players, or you can have two senior DPs, which most teams don't don't fill all three of their spots. You can have two senior DPs and four U22 players, plus an extra $2 million in general allocation money. If you were to go younger. Per season. Which, that th- that's the part that I think relates to us in MLS Next Pro. Uh, because it is, if you think about MLS Next Pro, you've got the 11 mandatory spots for Next Pro contracts. You've got academy players that, that you know, can, can play with the team on academy contracts. You have... Um, you know, and then sometimes you get some senior, some senior roster designated players, uh, not designated players, senior roster designations, um, uh, of the 30 MLS roster spots of which only 20 are senior roster. And then 21 through 30 are various levels of supplemental roster. It is on occasion in our short experience in the league that we have seen a couple players occupying Spots 24 through 26 and like 27 through 20, like something like that, like lower end spots. Like since he had two guys yes. in those spots that played, yeah. started and played against us. Correct. Uh, we sometimes see those types of players come down. With $2 million extra in GAM, which is a mechanism used, if you don't know and aren't familiar, it's a, mecha- a mechanism used to buy down contracts. So like you're not paying the player less. You're saying, uh, to use an example, uh, I'm paying this player $120,000 a year is their budget charge. That's acquisition. That's their salary, whatever it is. That's $120,000 is their budget charge. I'm going to use $20,000 in GAM, general allocation money, to pay down their contract to be $100,000 on the budget charge. The player still makes their whatever. This is the same, if you're a fan of the NFL, like the same dumb salary, not the same, but like the similar dumb salary cap gymnastics because the uh, Major League Soccer is run by MLS, a former or current um, and, and, and NFL this, owners. Like yeah. they've put a salary cap in place to, number one, to have parity, right? And, and it was really important at the beginning that it existed, just sort of a little, another little side tangent here, because at one point you had 10 teams and you had three owners. Yeah, basically. Or four owners. Like, so there was a point where you needed to keep salaries down and you needed to keep some parity so that one owner who owned three teams didn't underfund drastically two of his and then, uh, or hers, I guess, but I don't think there was any female owners at that point. Um, and then, like, pump up the salary on one of them to go win with the one, right? Like they, they try to use it to keep parity and to keep survival because they kept everybody within the limits. Cause if one team signed a bunch of really high paid players, then somebody else might need to do that to compete and blah, 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 blah. Yep. However, I think you and I would both agree. We're long past needing um, this to be like the thing we, sh- we can and should open up soccer, if not completely like significantly, but here we are, this is the world we're in. And so knowing that like these rules exist tangentially related to CFC and the CFC podcast, it isn't too, 
even though I've just given a like pros and cons a little bit of like having a salary cap, whether we have a salary cap or don't have a salary cap is not going to directly affect us a lot, except for some of these rules made to change who we play every week or change some of the roster spots we play. So I, that's why I think it's interesting and I'm glad we went over it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll just add there are, uh, what I what I think the early effects. Uh, by the way, like MLS doesn't do a good enough job of making all of this crazy shit uh, public. So, like, I don't know. Me, fan, super big nerd. I don't know how much gam Atlanta or Nashville or Salt Lake City has sitting around right now. Mm. And for fans of the NFL, the NHL, whoever, like all these you know, leagues that have all kinds of complex salary cap rules and like mechanisms. One of the reasons why these leagues are popular, there are a lot of reasons, but like for some people, they want to dive deeper into it and become the Monday morning general manager. Mm -hmm. And having all of that stuff public is incredibly important in order to, to because we want fans. If soccer is going to take the next step in this country, and it's taken many steps already to this point, right? But if it's going to take another step in this country, we want enough transparency so that, you know, a listener of the Section 109 podcast that, like, is a fan of an MLS Next Pro team in Chattanooga FC, but, like, wants to, you know, get a little nerdy about, oh, I don't know, New York City FC, like, they should be able to... to do all, run all kinds of salary mechanisms and be like, no, like you just trade for this person for this amount, but not for this amount. And that's how you fit them under the cap, blah, blah, blah. You can't really do that right now because it's all a, a theoretical exercise. There's no way of actually knowing who's got what available. Uh, and that's before we even get into targeted allocation money, which is a bridge too far, thing, yeah. even for me today. Um, now let's go back to the, to the, the two, the extra 2 million in GAM. It is possible that one of the ways uh, that it could be used uh, is, in part, uh, you get to buy down more, a smaller amount of more contracts that hit the uh, $1.5 million threshold for becoming a TAM player or whatever. You can buy contracts down a little bit uh, and, 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 or keep people, keep people underneath a million and a half. Or, or, or get people from, you know, several guys that are making a million dollars, you use this extra money to bring them all down to $800,000. Um, try to improve your roster in that category. I would not be surprised if there are a couple of teams that are among the uh, lower spenders to go after the end of their roster. Uh, we saw this with the Miami game uh, and against Monterey. Uh, their bench was incredibly thin. Uh, and I don't actually think they made a sub at all in that game, including after they went down to 10 men when Jordi Alba got a second yellow card. Um, these, these, and this has always been a criticism uh, of, uh, of MLS. It's like the rosters are too thin. The, you know, senior players make whatever. And then like everybody else is on like the league minimum basically, which is, is not, you know, I think it might be like $70,000 or something like that right now. So I wouldn't be shocked to see, you know, one of these teams, one of these poor spending teams invest in the bottom of their roster to try to find domestic players that uh, could make a little bit more, say, in USL Championship for some of the, 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 the richer, bigger spending clubs like Louisville, like a Tampa, like a, a Phoenix, something like that, uh, to give them a little extra money to make it worth it to maybe not be a, a starter, an everyday player in USL championship, but instead be a, uh, a, make a little bit more money in MLS and then use that to buy down their contracts or buy down someone else's contracts, whatever, uh, in, in that way. I won't be shocked to see that. And if we do, the effect to MLS Next Pro is those players will likely be playing more minutes in MLS Next Pro because they may not be playing as many minutes in MLS which means the quality of MLS Next Pro from the, from the two-team perspective gets better, uh, which obviously has an impact on us and what we do. And winning games. And winning Potentially. games. Potentially. Potentially, yes. All, all this is very potential. We'll have to see what the effects are 
Uh, but yeah, that's not at all what I was prepared to talk about today. <laughs> And here we go. No, beautiful. I think that that is a wonderful nerdy, and somebody will have just skipped, uh, you know, fifteen minutes in the podcast now that we've uh, now that we've done that. Um, but no, I think that was good, and I, I enjoyed that. Player by player preview, Matthew. Let's start with the goalkeepers. Uh, I have transfer mark pulled up, um, which I think is fun. Um, but we right now have uh, by yours and my um, classifications, we have three goalkeepers, four outside backs. Four center backs, six central midfielders, five wingers, and two strikers. Um, let's go through those and uh, maybe argue about whether they should be in those uh, positions. So, Jean Antoine, um, striker, definitely a striker. Uh, he's in there. We haven't seen him play yet, um, but presumptive starter coming back from last year from a knee injury. Um, John Burke has deputized well. John Burke might continue to play here and there, but I suspect John will be back soon. And we signed Michael Beretta, who we've talked about, but I think it mentions it bears mentioning one more time. Uh, he is a young player coming out of Dalton State. He played for CFC before going to Dalton State. Mm-hmm. Um, he is incredibly, immensely talented, um, converted to goalkeeper a little later in his career, so he has wonderfully good feet, and he probably has the highest single season, single uh ceiling of anyone on this roster yeah i think that's fair to say um that doesn't mean he's gonna hit that he's also like one of the younger players on the roster he's 21 21 yeah but like he's got tremendous potential and i'm so so glad he's here um we've talked about the goalkeepers quite a bit i don't think there's anything super deep to go on those other than um michael beretta is slightly different physical profile than burke and john antoine michael's not a small guy um but he's not quite the towering giant that both those two guys are um and I, I think do I think it's a little interesting that we haven't seen Michael on the bench except for that very first game. So I, I wonder if that's something about where he is development wise. If he has a small injury, we don't know. Um, but projection wise, you know, it's going to be interesting to see where he goes during the season because he could hockey stick potentially. Yeah. Outside backs. So we have one foreign spot in the goalkeepers. Correct. Is Sean Antoine occupy a foreign? Well, actually, let's talk about foreign spots and domestic. So in MLS Next Pro, we can have seven foreign spots, right? Yes. Um, I was going through labeling some foreign spots here, and I got to eight, which means one of these guys that I thought was a foreign spot who might do, not who, be. Who do you have? So I'm going to go through them with you because I know you're going to probably yell at me. Uh, Jean Antoine, mm-hmm. foreign spot, because you and I both believe while he's not, while he is like on whatever lets him play here and has been for a while, he's likely not considered a domestic player um, by like MLS roster rules or whatever. I have Jesse Williams, I have Anatoly. I have Duvon, I have Farid, I have Jude, I have Callum, and I have Mehdi. I think that's eight. All right, so Mehdi and Callum, yes, that's two. Jude, obviously, yes, that's three. Um, Duvan, for sure. Farid, for sure. Anatoly, Jesse, and Jean. Oh, interesting. So uh, I looked up Transfer Marked while we were talking through all the MLS stuff um, to try to see if I could get it. Obviously, Transfer Marked is not. Um, we just never had good Transfer Marked. Now we have like decent. Um, the only thing I can find. So you and I were told that like Farid was in the process of like potentially getting off of that list. However, he was yeah. getting off that list. I don't, I don't know details on his familial status. I haven't, I haven't talked to him. He is listed on here with an American flag. So maybe he got off in time, off the list, or maybe one of Anatoly and Jean don't count. Those are my guesses. So I'm, I'm on, gonna again s- on the domestic versus uh, foreign. So spots. I I think we're we're hoping that Farid's green card arrives, but I to my knowledge it did not arrive in time for him to lose the designation on the on roster the rules. roster. So my guess is one of Jean or Anatoly. Uh, Probably, probably Jean. Jean. Uh, we'll have we'll have domestic. We'll have MLS domestic status. Um, yeah, that's my that's my guess. Uh, because of the type of the type of status that he possesses. And so, that, but I, I don't, I don't feel good enough about like proclaiming that. I don't either. I just was going through and and writing some little notes here, and I was like, huh, yeah. But that's my that's my guess. That makes sense because one of those guys we know 
Um, well, no, now I really don't know. Now you're going to have me confused. I know. It's, it's wild. Um, okay, so let's move on from the goalkeepers. Um, basically, you can have up to 24 pros. Oh, it's also, of, it's also se- possible. Seven of whom can be, um, quote-unquote, foreign spots, right? It's also possible we traded for a sport foreign spot, and there was just no no news about it. But I don't consider that likely, because I've, I've seen, I think, Huntsville in New York City announce a trade for a foreign spot. So Interesting. Um, but so going forward from there, you can have 24 pros, correct? Uh, no, you can have more pros now, but we, okay. When we started the season, it was 24 pros, right? And that you could have, and now it's like 30. Yeah. Cause it just changed those roster rules. Thanks MLS. Um, you can have 30 pros on the roster. We have 24 and then you can have five Academy, I believe spots. You can have more Academy spots than that. You just can't play more than five at any given time. Which is to keep the league from being all 16-year-olds. Um, and then you can have up to seven, quote-unquote, foreign players, and you can trade and buy foreign spots from yeah, other teams. I'll, I'll note for, for a clarification for folks, uh, a player, an, an academy player, when we, when we reference that, we mean like an academy amateur. So Gavin Castle. A great example. So New York City... Gavin Castle, by the way, is listed on Transfermarkt as a player for Chattanooga FC Academy, who is the only player on their roster who has been transferred uh, or is being transferred into CFC. Probably or like maybe a, from CFC like to a, there. Like maybe like a loan thing. Um, it's very cool. The Chattanooga the, FC Academy has a page on Transfermarkt. I love that. Transfermarkt. Um, so like New York City played, I think, three 16-year-olds, a 17-year-old, and a couple 18-year-olds against us. Some of those might be academy, like actual academy designated players. Some of them might just be 17 on a pro contract. And those 17 year olds on a pro contract don't count against mm-hmm. the the five academy or whatever. Uh is is an important important, I think, um delineation of that, of that rule. So going to the outside backs now, after the goalkeepers, we have Jesse Williams. Um, from Trinidad and Tobago at right back, Joseph Perez at left back, Milo Garvanian at left back, and Robert Screen at right back. Um, Matthew, tell me a little bit about our outside back core here. Yeah, so I think this entire outside back core was signed fairly early in the process. Uh, obviously, JP uh, was renewed from from the 2023 NISA season. And then our first, our, literally our first three next pro signings were Jesse Williams, uh, Milo Garvanian, and Robert Screen, and we've seen Robert only once in uh, in the Open Cup game. Uh, Jesse started both the uh, Huntsville Huntsville home opener game. He started against New York City uh, in between during the Open Cup and the FC Cincinnati game. He was gone on international duty, uh, and so you saw. So we've only seen like a little, a little bit of him, right? Um, JP started at left back, I think three games in a row. He came off the bench against New York City FC, uh, two team, uh, and then you've got Milo Garvanian, who started. At, <laughs> this is where it gets fun. He started at right wing against Huntsville, at right wing against Miami United in the Open Cup. This is a left back, by the way. Uh, he started at right back against FC Cincinnati too. And then started a left back against New York City. And then when Jesse Williams was subbed out for Joseph Perez, JP went to left back and Milo went, went to right back. Would you consider Milo Garvanian this year's Colin Stripling? You know, that's actually a possibly. Possibly. I, I, I truthfully I don't know, and maybe Rod doesn't know, and maybe you know, maybe nobody knows yet. Like, is he gonna carve out one of these spots? for himself to play in every week like Colin did. Uh, I don't really know. I do know that like having having healthy competition is really important. And and I think the the level of pros uh competing for spots with one another this year is is more than it's ever been in, in this club's pro tenure. Um and, and and hopefully that's a that's a really healthy thing and a healthy process and 
leads to better outcomes down the road. Just real quick, something we talked about before, you mentioned that we signed everybody early. Uh, you and I both believe the reason for that was because we knew we were losing Jesse Williams potentially for the whole summer for the Copa America. Now, that did not work out. Trinidad and Tobago did not win. But we're you, still we're still going to lose him though for uh, for games here and there for World Cup qualifying. Oh, we're going to lose him all throughout the year for games, like for him to go do things. But you and I both believe that we signed. Um, we'd already signed, obviously JP coming back, but we signed. Excuse me, Robert Screen uh, in particular, but also Milo early on to make sure we had cover at those outside back positions on a player that we knew was going to be gone quite a bit. And it turns out that Milo is just the jack of all trades currently. That yeah, plays. And, and we'll get to another player that I think also like ties into. To the potential for Jesse Williams uh, absences for international duty later. Center backs time. Also, actually, I want to ask you a question. How are you feeling overall about goalkeepers? Strength of the strength of the goalkeeping core. Uh, I feel good. I mean, like, I, I think that uh, I think I think old night trains had, you know, some some really, really good moments. He's had a couple nervy moments. Um, I mean, you got to remember, like he, he did not play a lot of game minutes last year. Uh, yes. He was the backup goalkeeper. Sometimes you just don't play a lot of game minutes. And um, I don't know. Like I, I think that could potentially lead to, you know, a nervy moment here or there. Uh, but overall, I thought he was, I thought he was solid. And I think that this experience in these first four games, if he does need to deputize for Jean Antoine again, and I don't know, maybe, he'll, maybe he'll get the start on Saturday. I don't know. Um, but I think that that will that experience will only will only benefit him. Um, I agree. So overall, you're feeling solid. Let's say like great, solid, or bad as three choices. I feel good. You feel good about the goalkeeper core outside backs. Do you feel gr- uh, good, solid, bad, something else? I think I feel solid. Uh, we don't have a we just don't have a ton to go on because of uh, the international duty. I agree. And, I, I could not agree more. And like, you know. And Milo's played right back. He's played and, right wing. Like, there's, yeah, there's been, just not enough really in there to, to know. Things have not settled down enough for us to know. Yeah. Center backs. Let's talk through center backs, then I want to see how you're feeling about them. Uh, so I believe we have um, three foreign spots used at center back. Something that is, I think, interesting to think about. Rod went out and decided, hey, this is a... I mean, when you see a foreign spot, quote unquote, usually that means that that is a, a key spot, somebody that you're really trying to get a really high quality player at because you're using a visa oftentimes on them. So we have Anatoly Prepolitsa, who comes back for this year and, uh, by the way, has been fucking excellent all all uh, beginning of this season. Duvon VFR, a new signing who listeners to this and viewers of this podcast will know, but shout out, by the way, we're on YouTube. Check us out. Um, we'll know that we... This particular podcast is very excited about Duvon. Um, Fareed Sarsar coming from um, Inter Miami 2. So a little little return to his roots um, from his playing days last year, uh, this weekend. And then Logan, who might be my favorite out of this group, only because his story is so fun because he's this year's Jung Woo So. He made it out of open tryouts. Yeah, that is really good. Uh, and getting assist in his first game. And and um, not basically not putting a foot wrong except for accidentally almost getting run over by Anatoly on a header. <laughs> yeah. Which that, didn't result in anything. That was, so that was a scary moment. So yeah, um center backs wise, look, you have two monsters size wise, right? Anatoly and Duvon. Um Duvon's slightly like shorter than Anatoly, but still a very big guy. Anatoly's an absolute freight train. Um we went with size there, and I I absolutely love that. Um, Fareed, on the other hand, not a small guy, but not near as tall as the other guys. And then Logan is somewhere in between. Um, again, not a small guy, but not a, not a really, really tall guy either. Um, kind of what are your thoughts on the profile that Rod went there, and what are your thoughts on kind of those four players? So, I think <laughs> I think Logan and Fareed are normal-sized for center backs, if we're being honest. Like, they're just normal-sized. Uh, and Anatoly's just so big that he makes the think, rest of <laughs> And I think Anatoly and Duvan are just <laughs> large humans. They are. They are. Well, one of them, like, yeah, one of them larger than the other. Duvan's a big boy, too, but, like, Anatoly's just and, like, such a monster. Y- you know when, you know when you, like, uh, and I, and I'm not, I'm not saying, like, if I say the word mistake or whatever, I don't, I don't actually mean that for, like, something that the, the technical staff made a mistake on in, in profile, so work with me here. But you know how, like, when you make a mistake on something and you want to fix it and get better at it, you adjust 
uh, and focus like so heavily on like making sure you don't do that thing that it it almost overrides some some other things. Sure. So we played we played with a a six two center back, a six one center back, and maybe a six foot center back in twenty twenty two. Did you just call Sebastian Capazucci six foot tall? Twenty twenty two. Oh, 2022. Okay, keep going. Uh, <laughs> and and in 2023, the move was, well, okay, like, we'll 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 find a six foot center back, keep one of those who's also just like a very good player, yeah, or the the maybe one of the best center backs in the league. Period. Well, in Nice he was. We'll go find yeah, and we'll go find a, like a six four guy. Uh, we'll take our six two center back and we'll just make him a right back, so we're even taller there. Uh, and then we'll go find a left back who is, you know, five ten or whatever, who also used to play center back. So he's, you know, maybe a little undersized for that, but he'll just be the left back and it'll work out fine. And then you go find Sap- Sebastian Capazucci. Um uh, and <laughs> we yeah, we changed our profile like it, size wise. We, we a completely lot. changed it. And and we started doing long throws immediately. And we started doing long throws immediately and it worked. Uh and then also like we know the next iteration of that was, oh okay, like let's get bigger and even more athletic at that other center back position. So like Logan and Freed are normal size players, but then you're essentially your swap was Duvan for Aiden. And, you know, I, I, and I think we've seen benefits from, from that on, on, on set pieces, uh, just the kind of, you know, not, maybe not goal scoring yet, but like def- defensively, especially like, I need you to put some respect on uh, Aiden's name, who the guy who was the ball was aimed at on every corner of ours. I re- referring to to this particular season uh, against like bigger, more skillful, like stronger forwards. Uh, I think there's a clear there's a clear move in in, in that department. Um, yeah, what was the second part of your question? How are you feeling overall about the? Uh, obviously, you answered the profile. Anybody you're looking out for in particular? Any things you're looking out for? You got any specific? predictions out of this group and then kind of what's your overall feeling your overall grade of the group i feel really good about the center backs obviously uh, obviously duvan didn't have a lot of time in training before before the matches started rolling in thank rod for the second preseason second preseason is gonna be really nice um but like look you know anatoly was ready to go straight away um uh, farid got most of a preseason uh logan has been been here since the beginning with open tryouts right um, and I don't think, you know, I don't think they signed him with intent that he was going to be the starting, the start oh, oh. of the first two games. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think he was. so. By the way, very Jung Woo So. Yeah. The parallels, but, the parallels are pretty, uh, pretty great with guy coming in on open tryouts, guy starting to start the season. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think, I feel really good about, about where we are with projected starters, where we are with, with projected backups. Um, you know, I've I've heard that it's a possibility that Anatoly uh, gets some uh, ha- has some interest from from the Moldovan FA. Well, I mean, he's had a ca- he's uh, had caps so in in in, in the past, yeah, and, and and be recalled in essentially. Sure. Um, and I think that that just goes to show, like, it's important to have a guy like Farid who can step in and do the job, who's likely the number three at, at center back. It seems. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really important to have have the other guy, you know, the number four in Logan. Um, and this is his first pro contract. Um, played for played for UMass uh, for a couple of years, and then played for University of Dayton, a good soccer program, for a couple of years. Um, so yeah, I, I think having that that level of player is, is massively important. So I feel really good about the center backs. So I will say I feel great about the center backs as well, and I will uh, put a hot take out here that I think you will actually agree with. I think center back is our strongest position group. Um, I think center backs are our strongest position group. I don't know if I disagree with that. Top to bottom, I think it's the I think it's the um, the strongest. Which is no shade to anybody else. I just think our center backs are real fucking good. Yeah. Um, okay. Central midfield. Um, starting with newcomer. Haven't seen him yet, but if you stalk his Instagram, you might see some highlights of what looks like him in practice today or yesterday. Jude Arthur. Followed, who should be uh, a six for us, uh, Andres 
um, who has played the six all essentially all the first four games of this uh, very young season. Callum Watson, who occupies a foreign spot along with Jude Arthur in this group uh, from England, our first incoming transfer for which we paid cash. We don't know the amount, but pretty cool. Callum has not featured a ton, but he should feature the 810. Uh, Luis, who we know well, and then Ethan Corn, kind of the last guy in that position group that um, I think you and I wouldn't have uh, guessed would be at striker for the first two games. Yeah, and you need to put some respect and on Alex, subbing Mc- in Alex the, McGrath, who you forgot on that list there. The, the club captain, captain. The captain. Hold on, let's put some respect on his name. Alex McGrath. Captain. Yeah, the, the, the nailed on starter, the captain. Um, I was just trying to talk about new guys. I, I just completely <laughs> skipped over our, our captain, Alex McGrath. Uh, Matthew, take me through kind of how you're looking at those positions in that position group. And uh, now I would also like to look... Well, actually, no, keep going. Keep going with that. Tell me those uh, those midfielders. How you feeling? How you so looking? let's start actually at the bottom with Ethan Corrin here because, you know, I, I think we didn't know that Ethan was going to get re-signed. Um, and we knew that he was in, in preseason. You know, he was playing at center back. He was playing a little bit at the six. Also, a little, bit, a little bit at the eight. Interesting that we've listed him as a central midfielder here, not a center back, when he was a center back ostensibly all year last year. Yeah, I'm all, I only did that in, in full honesty because... Uh, he became the sixth midfielder. So you have three players for the first team and three players for the second team. That's it. No, no, that makes sense. Also, um, I just don't, but be- like, I don't believe he's starting no offense to him, but over any of those center backs, our center back, we're such a deep center back core right now. And like think- he, he might play in a real pinch, but like we didn't sign guys that are as good as Ethan Corn at center back. Again, no offense to Ethan. We signed game changers at center back. Well, and, and I would, I would say probably the same at, at central midfield, but like, that's why I don't agree th- with that. But that's one of those things. If you've got a guy who can play the six, uh, who honestly you trust him on the ball enough that you could probably play him as, uh, if you take that that six and two tens, you can easily make that two sixes and a ten in to the pre- close out games. In the preseason, he played center back six, eight ten. Yeah. I realize he wasn't truly playing as a ten ten, but like he was playing as an eight slash ten, one of the the yeah. Luis and Alex role during the preseason. He played at the six and he played mostly at the center back, but we, in the preseason games we watched. So obviously like they have some faith. And I think you and I would both say as well in a real pinch, probably fourth on the depth chart, but in a real pinch, you might see him at right back. Yeah. I think that that, that's a possibility as well. A la Colin Stripling. But like you sign a guy who's young, who's still got talent, clearly wants to be here. Um, who knows the system very well. Knows the system very well. So well that he Rod started well. at the fucking nine to start the season. Yeah, I'm not even to that part yet, honestly. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it's, if you lose a guy like like Anatoly on international duty, you've got like a ready-made center back that can, that can roll in down the depth chart. You've got him, you know, available for for coming off the bench in midfield. So you may not see him you know, if we take 18 players in the road, right, and everybody's available, you may not see him go on the road. Uh, but if you have a couple of inter- of absences for international duty, all of a sudden a guy who can play center back and play the six, potentially right back as well, like makes a ton of sense to all of a sudden take. So here's, I'll give you a real hot take. We've seen Ethan Corn in three of the first four games. Twice as a starter, once as a substitute towards the end of a game. By the way, came in essentially as a striker in the third game. No, 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 no. There is no essentially, like... He's only played the nine, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put a wild hot take out there for you. Um, I think we're gonna see Ethan Corin a lot more this season than we expected because I think he's gonna be a little bit of that Swiss Army knife. And I agree with you; he's gonna be mostly at home, uh, barring injury crises, him taking a big step forward or international duty. Like there's probably 18 guys that are on the roster that are gonna travel before he does, and we're likely to take 18 or 19 on the road. Is likely the number that we're gonna take, I believe. 18. Yeah. So we previously we used to take 17, 18 is kind of the right number, right? It's just so everybody does the math. We have five subs. So you have 11 plus five that takes you to 16 and you get a goalkeeper and you get one extra flex player essentially. So it gives you um, your full complement of five subs plus one player, um, which love that. But so we may not go on the road a ton. I agree with you, but I think we're going to see him in a lot of 10 minute cameos because I think you can plug him in running around up top. We proved that to do a job and which he did well. I mean, like if, you, can if pl- you can plug him in in the midfield to help close out a game. If you're you can plug three, him in at right back. You can plug him in. At, there's all these places you can plug him in to help close out a game or to go, I guess, run after attacking a game if you really wanted to, though that one's a little weirder. Remember the Cincinnati game when we were still a little bit thin at winger and we had subbed out Medi after his after his goal to make it. And we went nil. to a 4-2-4. And 
Carlos was the sub at striker. And then we subbed out a winger late. And Ethan subbed in for that winger. Carlos moved out to right wing. Ethan played, goes up top. And we it's, played a 4-2-4. It's, it's very similar to in 2018 when Bill Elliott would sub on Jonathan Ricketts. Yes. Because he was just the biggest body. And the, and, and he was subbing, and he was usually subbing out Charlie Clark at the same time. Good athlete. Right. To run around, yeah. Yeah. So that's my that's my hot take that we're going to see uh, Ethan Corn a lot more than we expected, and it won't be at the six for center back. That's the wild. That's the wild thing. Um, talk talk me through who you think your three projected starters are um, in central midfield. As we're in the first, I think you and I would agree it's probably pretty clearly on paper, not not advocating, but on paper, Jean Antoine, Jesse, and either uh, JP or Milo, and then Anatoly and Duvon are your two starters at center back. Central midfield, who are your three starters? And I think we're ours are different. They might projected be, wise. But like so we've never under under Rod, we've really never had what I consider to be five players for three spots. We've had four. We've only ever had four. We've only ever had four. And that's really fun. That's a really good problem to have. I think we very clearly have five. It's very fucking good. Yeah, it's fantastic. And and, and like I I almost want to do a cop out here and not like give you just three names because we'll talk me through your logic then. I think we're going to based on looks that other teams are going to give us. I think certain players are going to be to, to fit better um, in, in, in certain games. This is a wild take because Rod Underwood has never once adjusted to the opponent by playing a different player or a different scheme based on the opponent. Yeah, but we're not a Nisa anymore. And there actually is depth on on the team. So you know, I, I think there's I think there's the possibility that in some games we might want to actually have, you know, two sixes or a player that can be a second six but also be a ten, but also be a second six. And you know, is that player Alex McGrath? Is that player Andres Jimenez Aranzazu? You know, I, I have a feeling that, you know, our second international transfer ever, Jude Arthur, is probably going to, like, I don't know if he's going to be up to speed by this weekend ready to go, but, like... Yeah, I'd be pretty shocked I have if he's, a feeling if he's starting he's this weekend. I have a feeling he's probably going to be the, the, the regular six. I mean, they, they specifically went out and got him after Richard's, uh, yes. Richard's retirement announcement, right? Yes. So I got I got to think that like he's probably going to be mainly the guy at the six. Um, where does that leave Aaron Zazu, who we have a question in here from uh, from Simon Edwards that we'll get to a little bit. We, we might want to get to it now because uh, it's an, it's an interesting question. Uh, we, what do you make of him so far? Like you know, he's got some stats in here that are a little bit beyond the stats that MLS Next Pro provides. I can only assume Mr. Edwards has a Scout account or something. And uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing the password, that'd be great. I would like to ask Mr. Edwards a question. What the fuck are you doing listening to this podcast? You're getting dumber by the minute listening to two morons uh, bloviate about um, uh, players. That said, let's answer this question because it's a good one. Yeah, and um, and and for the record— Also, I, I don't think he's listening. I think he just follows us on Twitter. I don't think he's dumb enough for, to listen to this podcast. By you saying that, I think we're about to find out. I will also mention, like, he's not—and he, he mentioned it in, in the tweet— uh, for the for this mailbag, he's not un, unbiased. Like I'm pretty sure he's like Andres's agent. To be very okay. clear, so um, read me the question because uh, you 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 hinted at this earlier, but you were not reading it when we were chatting pre-show. So the question is, what have you made as Andres and Menez Aranzazu at the six so far? Uh, and then there are a couple points listed: most tackles and most touches per ninety in the league, five tackles uh, and most touches one hundred and ten per ninety in the league, most duels won and chances created at CFC. And then he's got an 88% pass completion. Uh, just for the record, MLS Next Pro's website has him down at 84.2. So I'm not sure if that includes the Open Cup game or not. Please let us know in the comments if you don't mind. Because I'd just be curious like, what your what data you're using versus what I have access to, which is not nearly as good as I want it to be. Oh uh, yeah, uh, wish we had White Scott access. That'd be amazing. But let's take the let's take the gist of the question. Like, what have you made a, 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 of Andres at the six so far? 
uh, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pull back the curtain a little bit and do something we never do, which is we never have any negative talk of players on the podcast. But I will say with full candor, candor, not candor. Um, I thought he was rough for the first two, not terrible, but like just like up and down a lot for the first two. And I thought he was really good the last two. Um, I thought he was much improved against Cincinnati. Um, and I thought he was go- very good against New York in comparison, except for one shove in the back that I thought was the most Colombian thing I've ever seen <laughs> in my life uh, that he got away with. So like, like far be it for me, but I gave my, my Colombian friend shit about it because uh, it was a wild thing to do. Um, but also like I have loved overall the uh, development. I love the idea of Andres as well. Having watched his, his tape before, I do think he profiles well. Um, my eyes don't. It's interesting to hear those stats because my eyes don't back up all of those stats. The duels one is a wild one. The tackles per ninety leading the le- or leading the league is insane. It's also not that one, and the touches are not super surprising to me. And here's why: because he this season this season so far has been asked to do the roving Richard Dixon thing, and while he has certainly missed a few tackles. He has also made so many challenges because the eights are often up the field and it is incumbent on that six to run a lot and do a lot. And I think we're going to see Jude Arthur do a lot of that. We saw Richard Dixon do a lot. So I've liked, I've loved his uh, willingness to challenge. I've loved his running. I've loved his effort. I'm not shocked that he's had so many touches. Him leading the league in touches is a little bit crazy, but like not shocking to me either because of how much the six can get involved in possession. And look, he's very good in possession. And in that those first four games, like he got better and better in possession and knowing kind of where to be. I saw his comfort level go up, like th- create real chances off of that. Those aren't surprising to me. The duels one thing is surprising to me because I don't feel like he wins that many, but maybe it's just a number of like duels that he makes. And and I think part of that is or challenge gonna, that he makes rather. I think part of that's gonna be the amount of like touches that he has in general. So if he's got like a you know, if he has a touch in central midfield and then he just like, you know, shifts the ball, you know, past a guy and then plays the pass forward or sideways or whatever, like that's a dual one. Because someone challenged him and he was able to, to get out uh, and, and, and play. Um, he's also played, ev- I'll also point out, he's played every single minute yeah. of our MLS next pro season. Um, and I expect that to continue. This is one of the reasons I wanted to get to your prediction because I think you and I disagree on this. I think he's going to play a lot this season. I think he will be one of the starters at the six, uh, this the eight slash 10. And I think he'll be the most likely guy to drop in next to the six when we're chasing something. Not chasing, sorry, when we're defending. Um, and yeah, I've been pleasantly. The one thing I haven't seen is the line splitting pass on the ground um, yet. It's only four games in, so like I'm not. But I've been pleasantly um, not surprised. I've been I've been happy with his performance overall. I've been really glad to see the growth because like the first two games it was like, who a little you know a little up and down and from everybody, but a little mm-hmm. up and down. And then like game three and four, I remember I, I called you at some point and I was like, Andres was really good last game. Yeah. I can't remember which game that was. I think it was game four. Um, so yeah, I've I've been I've been happy with it, and I I predicted that he would be a starter in the in the preseason when you and I talked, uh, and I still think he'll be one of the starters going forward. So we've scored six goals in 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 three games in the league. Um, yeah, this is wild. You told me this earlier, and Andres uh, at this point, get yourself another one. Oh, uh, <laughs> look at that! Another on ice too. Do you want the grapefruit truly, or do you want the ranch water? Uh, I'll do ranch water. Even finish yours, dude. Stop being a well. I'll, I'll finish it after I after I talk for a second. Um, Andres, we've scored six goals in, in in the league so far. Andres has four, uh, four goal goal involvements. Now they don't go down in uh in my stat sheet that I keep, which is goals, assist, and hockey assist make up a goal contribution. Should we change it from ML- uh, hockey assist to MLS assist now that we're in the MLS program or should we leave it at hockey assist? Hockey assist. <laughs> I'm not giving them credit. Fuck yeah. Keep going. Uh, so, but but he has four goal involvements if, if you go broader because think about it. Can you imagine Simon listening to that entire MLS talk before waiting to see if we answer his question? Don't do that to yourself, dude. <laughs> this is why you don't <laughs> listen to us, man. Uh, so, he's got four goal involvements. Number one was the um, was the penalty that Alex McGrath scored uh, to make it two one against Huntsville. Yep, drawn uh, by he, Medi. He's the one played the that that played the ball in behind for Medi to run onto and very dangerous foul. ball. Yeah, Medi earns the hockey assist. Uh, is how we in on this podcast 
do our statistics. The the player who earns the penalty uh, gets the hockey assist. Unless they Assume, take it. Unless they take it, in which case... They just get the goal. Yeah. Um, but he also had two hockey assists straight up uh, for the first two goals against FC Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and in both instances, it's his play. He draws multiple defender uh, d- midfielders, probably, in the middle of the field, and both times slips a ball out. Um, one, like he very clearly like drew everybody, slipped a ball out, and the goal is created. Another one, he's just playing a pass square. And the difference in that game, by the way, he also had the challenge of the game, where he absolutely murked a guy for a clear red card, <laughs> and it was not called, which was chef's kiss good. Loved it. Um, the difference in that FC Cincinnati game in particular is that in that game, he I felt like he was so much more comfortable in his spacing and his movement. The reason he played those dangerous balls, I think, out was because he found himself in like um, like balance or um, I don't know what the right word is. Anyway, like basically like in harmony as sort of with his teammates in that midfield, they started moving kind of as a unit and move and changing as a unit. And he along with you, you see Alex and Luis do this a lot, right? Who have played together for three full seasons, right? Two here and one at Stumptown. No, one here, one at Stumptown. So three, this is the third season they've played together. You see where they kind of know where each other's going to be, right? It's one of the reasons Luis, I think, has been so good this this season so far is you can just see how he knows the position and the and the the way where I wants to play. You could see in that FC Cincinnati game, FC Cincinnati 2 game in particular, that Andres slipped into that type of flow where he knew where to be. He knew what to do. He knew where to draw. He knew where the other player was going to be. And it was it was great. He was one of the best players uh, on that particular day, I felt like, in a lot of moments. And I was very, very happy with how he played. And I didn't realize he got two hockey assists, but after you told me, like it, it clicked that like that makes sense. Yeah. Because he was just, he very much upped his game and upped what I felt like it was his comfort level in that game. Uh, he also played the ball uh, for the ball in behind over the top for Taylor gray. Yes. Um, uh, that, that. Who, who Taylor like, you know, shoots it safe by the goalkeeper and then he heads it in. Andres is not, that's get... the, that's the New York uh, game yes. against New York, that's... which by the way, I'm surprised, you know, that it was him that played it over the top. Cause you couldn't see shit in that game. And you're that Sonisa moment of the day. I'm a trained professional. Um, I also watched the replay about a thousand times. Uh, but like he's not going to get credit for that in the stat sheet yeah. uh, for an assist. But we'll call it a goal involvement. But th- that's very much a goal involvement. Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, and so like that's a really, really good sign. I don't think he's going to be the six. I think Jude Arthur will, will become the six. It might take a little while. It will take a max of 10 days. <laughs> But like, it, Ju- like I'm not, Andres, I don't believe is a six in Rod's system. He is a six slash eight, or is an or he is an eight. And and the reason why I don't think he's a six in Rod's system is because the six is re- required to cover crazy ground. Uh, and and the one limitation in these first four games that we've seen is that there are moments where uh, Andres is just not of the athletic profile of a guy like Richard Dixon or Jude Arthur. To be able to recover and cover all the ground and, yeah. and cover all of the ground that's required. Or honestly, not and a, that's not enough. Not because even the, not even the same athletic profile as Alex McGrath. It's just Alex McGrath has been playing farther forward. But like Alex Richard and Jude Arthur on tape cover a lot more ground than look. Andres covered tons of ground effort wise. Yeah, but that's I don't believe that's his game. And also, you've seen a little bit of the the final ball or the or the second to final ball play. Like I don't want him playing that at the six. Like let someone else cover the ground. Let him go forward. Well, and and so hopefully, or let him line up alongside the six. Yeah, so I I think I think his his best position is going to be call it one of the tens or whatever it is, but he'll probably be dropping in a little bit, playing sometimes as a six when we need to absorb some pressure, like playing a little bit kind of in those half spaces. Uh, I think that's kind of where he was mostly playing for Las Vegas last year, and I th- I think that's where he likely projects long term. Is that a starter? Probably a lot. I don't know if he's going to start the next 25 games. But like... I think he's going to start 20. I think he's going to start 18 of the next 25. This is one of those things where like... It's a very specific prediction. We've never had this amount of depth. So let's go through some of the other midfielders real quick. Um, And I guess we'll talk about a little bit why. Uh, Next up, Luis Garcia Sosa. Who has started three of the four games. uh, All three league games so far. 
I think when we were projecting this roster, you, you look at the midfielders, Jude Arthur, Andres, Callum, Alex, uh, Luis, and Ethan Corrin. Luis is very clearly one of these things is not like the other. Uh, Luis, is a, Luis is a 10. He is, he is very all- much a get into pockets of space, uh, little pockets of space. Little, you know, little there's quick, no quick reason movies. for you to call Luis little. <laughs> just, just these. Also, sign, uh, completely unrelated. Uh, the Andres and Luis special in the preseason, where they had similar haircuts. Oh, that was annoying. And they were both. They had no numbers on their jerseys, and from a long distance or on a shitty stream, it was real fucking tough to tell who was who. Um, which I told Luis that, and he was like, "We don't look like at all." No, you don't. But you from, don't up close from a hundred yards. You might. <laughs> It's very Damien and um, uh, Ali Jaimes. Al- Damien and Ali Jaimes problem. Where up close, you do look nothing alike, but like hair, size, stature, distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, for sure. Luis is the most out of the five starters. And I think you and I both classify, no offense to Ethan Corrin, as like Ethan Corrin is the utility man. Yeah. Um, who who can play the 6, 8, 10 or center back. Um or striker, sorry, I forgot about striker. <laughs> Let me change but that. Yeah, so you, you've but got, Luis is a different piece, so he, keep he's, going. With he's going to be finding pockets of space. He's looking to play, you know, quick passes. Um, you know, he can dribble a little bit too, but he's he's mostly looking to play. Uh, he's mostly looking to play like the pass, uh, and you know, he'll he'll take shots too as well. Like he, he's got that in his locker, but his his involvement almost always is. You know, collecting the ball and then doing something quickly with it um, in, in in kind of higher leverage spots. Whether that's trying to play it in behind for for a striker, whether that's playing it into trying to split some lines for for a winger, maybe. Um, you know, I, I I think that's that's where his game is. No one else really has that on this team that I've ever seen, not at least not the way that he does it, which makes him a really useful option off the bench to change games with. Uh, or if Rod does a thing that I don't think he has ever showed a, a, a tendency to do, but if he does line up differently against different teams with different personnel, by yeah, because the person, then Luis the personnel is, is the policy and Luis is the way to change that policy more than almost anybody else in that 8-10 group. So Actually, the more than anyone else in that 8-10 group. The principles that we'll play with are always the same. And and the approach is always the same. But if Rod wants to do certain different things or, or show different looks to different opponents, you affect the game with personnel. And that's where I think we'll see... I, I, think, I'll, I think that's where we'll see like choosing three guys out of these five spots. Let's do Alex McGrath next. And then we'll save Callum for the end. Alex McGrath, um, absolute workhorse, engine for days. Captain. Captain. Leader. Leader. DJ. DJ. Legend. Uh, great in the press. Great on the great on the mic. <laughs> Mercy. Um, uh, there are no lies detected here, con- my friend. Contributes goals and assists. Plays bangers. Uh, com- Play uh, contributes to hockey assist as well, like kind of a do everything kind of guy. Uh, he's never he's he's never not played for Rod, so like someone's gonna have to play him out of the lineup, in my opinion. Um, and I just don't think that's happening, and man. I and I don't know if that's gonna happen or not, but like someone's gonna have to do that if they you know because he's just always played. Um, he is really really elite. Uh, one of my favorite things about him on tape, and this goes back to the Stumptown days is ability to find a pocket of space deep, pick up the ball, recognize the field in front of him, take the ball 10 or 20 yards, and lay it off and start a movement from there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also like lay the ball off and then not just stand there and wait, but continue his run. Maybe it's in behind. Maybe it's an overlap. Maybe it's you know he's just going to veer off and let somebody else fill the space that he just left. That's a really, really valuable thing because passing and moving and, and and trying to force the defense out of its shape is is just so vital to how we play. So Alex progresses. I would argue that Alex progresses the ball, and and people may not see this, but this is how I see it. Um, if you look at Andres and Alex, I will and and Luis, I will leave um, Callum out because I don't have and Jude 
because I don't have enough data. And then Ethan hasn't played a lot, so I don't have enough data there. But Andres, um, and I would it'd be interesting to see if there's actually stats that back this up or, or tell me I'm wrong, but Andres progresses the ball through passing. Luis mostly recycles and progresses the ball through passing. Uh, and I guess Andres also recycles the ball, but they both re- do it through passing. Um, yes, uh, Alex can play a progressive pass, and he does. He's played some line-splitting balls before, but most of his ball progression is through the dribble and taking space. Not just beating a guy, which he beats a guy, but as you pointed out, like taking the ball and moving into the space and dribbling, like the guy can move. And that's really like he starts breaks on his own. He by stealing the ball, by pressing and getting the ball, but also by just taking the space that maybe another player might not take immediately. He always takes that space. Yeah, I, w- I would be interested to see his progressive carries numbers versus everybody else. Yeah, I would. I would too. I absolutely would too. So you've been dodging my question. Last player. We're not done yet. Ethan Corn. Callum Watson. Ethan Corn, uh, Callum Watson, your guy we talked about earlier. Where do you see Callum um, slotting in, and why do you love him so much? I love him and, so much because he uh, he played for Halifax, so that's my boy right there. Um, I think I think Callum projects as an eight slash ten in this in in, in our system, and uh, and and I think he is that because. Uh, I think it was Rod who, who who said this to me that he he exhibits qualities. What was of, that word? He he exhibits qualities okay. of a ten sometimes, a six sometimes, uh, but not necessarily. He's not a ten, and he's not necessarily a six either. And I think, especially in those in those eight eight slash ten spots, that's super important. Well, this the is- amount of times that a a one of our tens will veer out and become a right back um, to then bring the ball forward uh, from spaces that we've, that we've left intentionally left, left open happens all the time. And, and if you are going to occupy a right back spot, basically you also, if the ball turns over for whatever reason, you also have to be able to immediately move into position, become a six uh, at times. I mean, what did Rod say on our podcast? You have to, if a right back has to be, be able to be, you don't have to be able to do it for 10 minutes, but you have to be able to be for 10, 20, 30, 60 seconds, depending on the cir- circumstance. A right back has to be able to be a center back. They yeah. have to be able to be a right winger. They have to be able to be a six and a right back. And they have to be those for varying amounts of time. But if the players don't have that versatility to positionally do those things, they can't do it. So what yeah. you're talking about, six, eight, ten, is the exact breakdown that he gave on our podcast and just remains to be true in, in uh, positional football. So they really, uh, similar to, to Alex McGrath, they really like... Callum Watson's motor uh, exhibited that at Creighton exhibited that at Halifax. Uh, he's going to get in the press a how, bunch. How can he have gone to Creighton? And you guys be cool. <laughs> well, Is that your arch nemesis? No, it's not. They're in Omaha. We don't really care that much. Uh, they are a biggest rival though. That's what um, I mean. And, and I, and I want to be able to interview him about, about his Creighton days though, because like the team he played on was stacked. I mean like Duncan, he played with Duncan McGuire. Like, you know, I don't know who that is. Uh, drafted by Orlando City last year, scored like oh, I do know who that is. Goals, I do know who that is. I do a know failed that is. Yeah, move yeah, yeah. to Blackburn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I know. Sorry, like, sorry. I do know who that is. I mean, that team I think was a national runner-up, maybe uh, his senior year. Possibly, he played with Danny Whitehall at Hastings College in Nebraska. That's the wild one, for which me. is going to be hilarious. Shout like, out, incredibly fun. But yeah, they like his motor. They like him in the press. I like his motor, and I like him in the press as well. Um, in the small moments, I've seen him a lot. His this is a small sample size for for the league, but his passing completion. How amazing is it that we have a I know. table that has real stats in it? This is it, it's it's way too small of a sample size, but his passing completion is above ninety percent. Um, I think they they really like his ability to get to get goals and assists from that ten spot. Podcast idea: ten games in, we look at the stats and see where we are. Yeah, for sure. But I'm just trying to use. This I'm not as a saying we can't. Right now, I'm not but. saying we can't use anything now. I'm just saying like, and we shouldn't. By the way, ten and, games. And the by the way, if anyone from MLS, MLS Next Pro is listening, fix your fucking XG. Like it's still broken. It's still broken. Fix it. Figure it out. Have someone watch the game back in the in the studio and just plot it by hand. But fix it. It's very annoying. Tell him. Okay. So I, I, I also like Callum. Um, overall, I really like his motor and his, his pressing. Um, so okay, let, let me let me give you let me give you two different scenarios, uh, three different scenarios for the starters. For the starters, let's go. Scenario number one: It's a team that we think 
is going to be able to be more ball dominant than we are. Okay? I'm listening. Scenario like that, you might want to have um, a, 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 a more athletic player as one of your as one of your tens and potentially your only 10 a player that's more likely that when passes get sprung can be an option among the striker and the two wingers in a counter-attacking situation in that scenario you're probably playing jude arthur at the six you might want to play a secondary six like andres who can be that 10 in possession but also can play some of those line splitting balls from a little bit deeper and provide a little bit extra cover in, in, in midfield for a better shape. Okay. That's scenario one. Scenario two, you think you're going to have 75% possession. Like you're going to be all over it. I think you probably want someone like Jude Arthur at the six for cover because you're going to ask them to do a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, that type of, that type of game, you might want to see a Luis Garcia Sosa. To help break, like if you're going to have 75% of the ball, like you're probably going to need some help breaking down the team. And you need that little extra quality, that little extra something different. In that scenario, you know, <laughs> I just set myself up for, for, for a scenario where you need to choose one of Andres, Alex, and Callum. How do you make that choice? I have no fucking clue. That's not my job. Uh, and then there's a scenario that's, that's a little bit more in the middle of that. And you're probably looking at you know, is it is it Alex Callum and and Jude? Is it, you know, Callum Andres and Jude? Is it who did I forget? It? Is it Callum and Andres and Jude? I think Jude Arthur is going to be the six. You for, you forgot Alex in one of those. Um, what, I, whatever. Keep you, going. You, keep you, going. Get, you get my point. Yeah, I, do, I, I, I think do. I really think Jude Arthur is going to be the six. I think there's a reason why they went and got him for for uh, to replace Richard Dixon. And I'm not, I'm honestly, I'm not totally sure how the rest of it goes in because we've not seen Jude once uh, in, in, in a match. Mm -hmm. We've only seen Andres at the six. Uh, we've seen him a little bit in preseason at one of the tens, just a little bit. And him in, and him in moments, him and um, Alex definitely interchanged a bit. Yes, but that, that's also just part of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've seen Luis a lot and he's looked good and sharp. We've seen Callum not a ton because he just started training the week before the Huntsville game. And, and we've seen Alex a bunch. Um, and, and, and we kind of know who Alex is at this point in time. Right. So second preseason. And one of the reasons why we're doing this preview is because there's going to be a lot to start happening on, on, on Saturday. And I guess we'll get the, the next three Saturdays in a row. That's going to tell us like what's been going on behind the scenes for the last two and a half weeks. Cause you and I are not at training. We're not seeing, unfortunately. I know we're not seeing fun. who is uh, who's getting reps with the, with the first group. We're not seeing the different combinations that are in effect. I bet there are a lot of different combinations uh, because we have we just have the bodies, we have the depth. I reject your premise that Rod is going to change based on the opponent. I just don't think he's going to do that. I'm not saying he should or shouldn't. I just uh, I would be shocked if he did. Um, I think it's going to be who played the best during the week. It will be the only rotation. Um, and I'm going to guess, since you're going to be uh, too scared to make any predictions, I'm going to guess the majority of the games are Jude, Andres, and Alex. Though That's my guess, that, the, that those kind of guys are the locked-on starters most of the time, um, Jude and Alex being the most locked-on of those. And then I think Andres will some occasionally get subbed out for, Call, for Callum or for uh, Luis. But I think, in general, Luis and Callum will just be your guys that come in. Similar to how Luis started... Um, about every game last year that he was healthy for and Beto came in um, when he wasn't. And then sometimes Beto would play and then Luis would come in. I think that will be the situation where you might see an Andres or a Callum or potentially even an Alex come out in the second half for another guy. I just think those three are your guys. Um, and I'm sad that you wouldn't make any predictions because I think it's fun to make bad predictions. I think my prediction is that, that Rod's going to do another Rod evolution. And that he that he's going to sometimes pick a rod volution, a rod volution that he's sometimes going to pick based on changing personnel to change the policy of how he wants to play. He might, which is like not to say we're going to be you know bunker ball and you know terrorism ball or anything like that, <laughs> but like that there's certain little things yeah, that it's you called Tony be able, Pulis ball. You son of a bitch. <laughs> there's certain things that you want to be able to do in, in in the attacking third that you want a different player on the field for. 
I just reject the premise that he's going to do that. He has always just played the best team and let them play, but I, I it is possible. It is certainly possible. Um, one guy we have not mentioned is Ethan Corrin, who we've talked about briefly earlier, so I won't go too far on it, but 6'8-10-CB striker Ethan Corrin is my label for him here. We literally talked about him at the beginning of the midfielders. And so I'm going to I'm gonna skip over the end of that then, because um, I think we've done him justice. I just don't want to leave his name out. in the. I thought we talked about him during the Senators' backs, but um, I just didn't want to leave him out at all. Uh, big stretch for Mix over there. Um, wingers, Matthew. Uh, left winger, I'm going to give you my classifications as I've added some classifications. Uh, left winger, Taylor Gray. Left winger slash right winger, Jesus Ibarra. Right winger, Damian Rodriguez. Right winger, Jalen James. Right winger slash left winger slash right back slash left back, Minjay Kwok. Um, talk me through this position group, um, which became, went from like super thin to kind of deep in about two, a two-week span, which makes me very happy. Um, but yeah, how are, tell me, talk to me about how you're feeling about this. Oh, you need another drinky poo. There we go. And, so uh, what yeah. if I told you that Taylor Gray leads the team in official goal contributions, three, uh, or goals plus exists at least, three, and also is joint top and fouling? I would say he's probably your, um, I don't know if new favorite players, right? Probably your current favorite player of this season. <laughs> uh, yeah. By the way, it's him and Andres are are, are tied with eight fouls each uh, in in the league. <laughs> you think I'm joking? But I've definitely looked that up. Oh, I know you're not joking. <laughs> uh, considering our text messages this uh, weekend were from you and another person who remain nameless because they're not on this podcast and maybe they don't want their name put here. Um, but if you two watching games in various leagues and being upset at the lack of fouling uh, in the games. Um, which you are a wild boy. Um, yeah, so Taylor Gray uh, would not have guessed leading the team in fouls. That is fun. That is fun. So let's start with Taylor. Uh, obviously, a good start to the season, uh, two goals and an assist. Uh, he's been he's been lively. I think he leads the team in shots as well. Uh, and and lot, these are not like he's not taking you know thirty yard shots just for fun. Like he's well, shooting took a few of those. He's shooting inside the box. It's a lot of those. And and that's really, really good to see. Inside um, the box, that trigger is a hair trigger this season for Taylor so far. Yeah. If he is in the box and he can get a shot off, he has taken it. And that is one time he should have clearly passed it. <laughs> and I, I, that just that's going to happen, right? Outside of that, I have loved every bit of it. Yeah. So I, I think he's had a really good start to the season. You know, there was always a, hey, buddy. Hey, Tobinho. For anyone who doesn't know, Uncle Matthew is Toby's f- uh, favorite human. There, my, Toby has three favorite humans outside of his parents. Come here, buddy. Um, it is my father, Matthew, and Mary. Those are his three favorite humans. All right, you can sit with me. Come on. So he's had a really good start at the season, and you know, com- coming off that that long injury last year, you know, we weren't we. I guess we weren't really one hundred percent sure. You know how how a major injury affects someone long-term and a baby. it was a terribly small sample, but like he, he looked pretty lively against club de Leon in his sub appearance um, at the end of, of last regular season. I thought he was very good in the playoff semifinal game. He was incredibly unlucky not to score. Um, and, and, and he started, he started where he left off, which is also where he was at the beginning of 2023. And, uh, that's that's incredibly important. Uh, I think this league is going to suit him very well, um, and and I, I I can only I can only think that there's going to be more good things coming his way. Uh, for my, I'll give you another very specific uh, prediction um, because I want to do those for this podcast. Um, and I'm I'm putting your only one so far as a major rotation in the midfield eight slash ten roles based on opponent uh, because I think that's a very specific prediction that we can. Sure. Attempt to, uh, I think Taylor's going. Taylor is the only locked on starter currently at the wing position, and I think that's not my specific prediction. That's just my thought, and I believe he will have the most. Uh, this is health, obviously, whatever. But um, I'm going to say when uh, if he's health remains healthy throughout the season, he will have the most wing starts of any player. I think that's. I don't think that. I don't think that's crazy. Um, I mean, I think he's he's the locked on left winger, and everybody else is fighting for the right wing and sub minutes. So that's that's a currently shout. Uh, let's move on to Jesus Ibarra. Uh, you know, Jesus... That would be goal. That's goal of the week winner to you, Matthew. Jesus came off uh, with a hamstring issue in the Birmingham preseason match. 
yeah. uh, did not feature at all against against Huntsville. I think that was intentional. He was on the bench. It was intentional because I uh, I spoke with him either before or after that game, and he basically said like I was technically good to go, and I'm paraphrasing, but I was technically good to go. But like it was kind of touchy, so like. I, I think I, I think he was only clear for like you know fifteen or thirty minutes or whatever it was, and so it was it was unsurprising. He was hoping to get in the game, but it was unsurprising that they just kind of saved him. Yeah, and he he only featured for ten minutes in the Open Cup game uh, off the bench at the end. Uh, did not start against FC Cincinnati too. Was subbed on at halftime uh, in in place of Jalen James, and was fucking electric. And and had an incredibly good second half, two goals. Uh, which is and should and could have I won't say should have could have had an assist very easily on a ball he played over the top to Medi that was hit uh, headed just um, was very close to being a goal. It was uh, it was an incredibly good performance and man of the match. I don't I assume he won man of the match. I, I assume. If he didn't, uh, that's a travesty. But he and a tragedy. But he was. Uh, as good as he is. That is the best game he's played in a Chad New FC shirt. And I realize he had like probably three XG in that one game by himself. Um, uh, yeah. But he didn't make any of those. And uh, yeah, like for those who don't remember, I he mean, had like, like four one on ones with the keeper. Remember, he, but this uh, game, this game was unbelievable. You know, he only scored, he only actually ended up scoring three goals last year uh, for the club. And one of which was a header. <laughs> yeah, one of them was a header. So like getting, getting two off the mark. Uh, is I think massively important. The Travella was was unbelievable. Uh, I mean, it was stunning. Un, un, I have watched that uh, I think no less than about four hundred and fifty times. Yeah, and so like that was really good to see. I, I think it's important to to realize like that was still only a forty five minute performance. He did start the next game against New York City again short rest, uh, and I it was not quite as Im- impactful. Um, but I think. I think in, until until I see otherwise, he, he's probably going to be the the right wing starter. Um, is, is is my is my guess? Uh, again, I, I have to see otherwise. But I agree with that supposition, especially because he's been here for a whole year. But uh, I think there's a, I think that is a still pretty up in the air. I think that is a position that Rod may just uh, depend who was good that week, because Jalen. Uh, had some good moments, especially in preseason. Um, he had some good moments. Oh, you're just gonna get uh, close this before my my stats get deleted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. So yeah, I think that that's that right wing position is very interesting. So I think there's a a maybe he's like the front runner currently for that starting yeah, spot. I think I think definitely is the front runner. But you have Damian and Jalen and Minjay when he gets healthy on his heels. Um, trying to get playing time. And I think while Taylor's spot is pretty nailed down in my um, estimation, I, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, Jesus is, is. So one of the things I think is, is, is most critical to, to note, and I'm going to go back to something I said in, for the midfielders is, you know, I, if you're not, per, the, the team has, has depth like in, in quality. And if you're not performing, if you're not, you know, if, if you're not, you know, 80%, or if you're only eighty percent of what you should be, there's probably someone that that can start in your place, uh, and you know, you know, you know what I mean. Like this, iron is, sharpens this iron. Is a, a, competition, yeah. Th- there's competition for places. There's legitimate competition for places. So, you know, I I, I think he, he, I project him to be the main starter, but two goals happened three weeks ago. So it comes down to like, what have you done for me lately? How has the last two and a half weeks gone in yeah. training? I don't, and I don't know. Like we'll, we'll find out. Tell me a little bit about Damien who we haven't seen yet. Remind us. And then uh, let's talk about Jalen and Minjay. So Damien's a tough one. He's not, he's just not played a lot for Rod. Um, a lot of injuries, a lot, ton of injuries, like just freakishly bad luck. I mean, like I was, so I listened to our, our, um, in preparing for this podcast, I listened to our two reviews. We did two reviews last year and this year we're kind of doing a all in one. Um, and in those reviews, we were so excited about Damien because he had come off that Atlanta United game where he was just such a difference maker and game changer. And yeah, he was electric. And then he would basically played in the Des Moines game scored and then I would argue he really never made an impact after that. Um, I mean, like he had some uh, like a, some five minute cameos and ten minute cameos and whatever else, but he really didn't. 
have any significant run of games after that because he was just injured the whole time. Um, and I don't know what to expect from Damian this year. It's a very make or break. He's 21 now. Um, it's a very make or break season. He's just 21. He's going into his fourth professional season. Yeah, I want to say he's got... Or third I, professional, I, I, I one say, of them are amateur technically, I, I want to say this is the p- penultimate year on his contract, but don't quote me on that because he got a contract contract extension last year. I think that is correct. Uh, so, But this is an important year, and, you know, I, I he's think... He's another guy, I mean, spoke of Michael Beretta. Look, he's a little bit... It's a little bit different because he's his size profile does not profile as clearly to the next level, right? As, as a guy who's probably five foot five, like that's not a size. You would be the exception, not the rule. Um, but also, like this is a guy who started his professional career at essentially nineteen, and his, he was playing in Nice at eighteen um, as an as a quote unquote amateur, I think. So he has a very high ceiling still. Uh, I think we're both still hoping he makes that next step because he could easily become the nailed on right wing starter if he stays healthy and takes that step forward that you and I both believe he could uh, take. I was just going to look at look at his stats from uh, combined from 22 and 23, three goals, two assists. Um, so I, I think there's there's obviously more there's also obviously more there from him. Yes, but. Uh, you know, it, it's going to be one of those scenarios where like, and, and it's not been this way in 22 or 23. Like, you know, I, I think it's, it was possible when we signed him, like, Oh, like, we're just going to give this guy, play the kids, like give him minutes, but you've got to also earn those minutes and you have to be healthy enough for those minutes. And, and that's maybe the biggest question is like, does, is Damien healthy now? And, and can he stay healthy? And can he stay healthy? And then and can if he, he does, find that form? Like, yeah. Can can he really? Because I, I think I think next pro is going to suit him more than uh, a league like the championship, which is just so much more athletic. He's he, he seems to do better when there's actual soccer trying to be played, as opposed to murder ball. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, tell me, Matthew, a little bit about Jalen James, uh, who I would argue was the preseason star, guy who had two goals. And an assist, three goals in the preseason. Um, he was basically our only offense in the preseason, but when we didn't have a striker and um, all of our wingers were broken. Um, yeah, tell me about Jalen James and kind of how you project him for this year. Well, if if we think Taylor and Jesus are going to be the main the main starters at least for now well, at at the wings, then, one of those guys. Then I think Jalen is. You know, you're looking for him for to be an impact player. Um, he's still Off young. He's still young. He's 23. He, um, I mean, I had an amazing preseason, like an amazing preseason. I think, you know, I, I think there was, there were some people in Lexington, uh, that thought he wasn't used well there. Uh, at least not effectively. And I think, you know, in Rod's system playing the, on the right side, as a left footer, you know, really, I think will suit him a lot. I think we saw that in preseason. Um, you know, I, I he had uh, he had the penalty kick and earn, and earned the penalty kick goal against Tormenta to win that game. He scored against uh, the couple days later. He scored against uh, the UAH. Um, he scored against the one of the UPSL teams. That we played in, uh, in 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 preseason in the season ticket holders game, uh, he also suffered a I think a concussion in that game on on the scoring play. So he's a guy who had the last few weeks of his preseason significantly affected, and you know he was I think he was in the same boat as as Jesus, uh, n- essentially not really available, definitely not available to start the season opener. Uh, he played ten minutes off the bench in the uh, in the Open Cup game, uh, along with a, a Jesus as we were chasing it. Um, I don't think he subbed in against FC Cincinnati. No, he started FC Cincinnati. I'm an idiot. He started that yeah, game. Yeah, he stayed by the first forty five. Went, went forty five minutes. Um, I thought he was decent in that game. Not not awesome. I think there's a reason why he was subbed out, sub, subbed off. Uh, but again, like he didn't have. He wasn't having a shocker. He was just 
No, it wasn't bad. It, it, was, just, like, it was one of those where your two wingers that are vying for space are each going to get a half. Yeah. And neither one are healthy enough probably for a whole. And, and I don't know if it was planned for, for each of them to get a half or not. I suspect it was. It's possible. It, it, crazier. Like, at, that's, at that, that's not that uncommon. At that point, that was Cincinnati. I guess Carlos had his ITC. Um, Carlos was available for that game. But Carlos was going to, I think, the scheduled sub at, at Stryker. Your left winger was Taylor. I don't believe Damien was fully available. I don't think he was. Um, and so you had two wingers who neither of whom were fit for 90 minutes um, at that right wing spot. I think Rogers divided that up into 45 and 45. And maybe like Jalen was going to get 60 and or or whatever. And then like, you know, because the half, the first half wasn't awesome, um, he he said, but my guess is it was just 40 and 45. And, 45. and I'll, I'll remind that we also had a game just a few days later, like four days later. and Which is why the 45 and 45 made so much sense. And, he, and Jesus started that one and went 76 minutes and Jalen subbed on. And I thought he was very good when he subbed on in that game. Uh, well, the, I the could, fresh legs. I, could, I couldn't see him. The fresh legs were... were the rapid. camera angle made it impossible to see what was going on. The fresh legs were incredibly important. And... Uh, I definitely, yes, once he came in, the game changed. Uh, when we made those subs in that New York game, as we talked about. We we really uh, put the game back in our um, in our control. I think I think he's going to play a big role. Cool, I do too. Um, Min J Kwok. This is a fun one. This is your boy. Uh, Guy I like as well, but I, I think you have a longer history with. So Min J scored four goals in the. Um, in the in, in the fall 2021 Nisa season, uh, which was 18 games, uh, I don't know actually how many games he played in. It wasn't all 18, but he scored four goals for Cal United Strikers, um, and then uh, and then he went to Syracuse the year after. Uh, I remember getting a call from from Fuller uh, in that like two week stretch where he was putting together that roster. Mm-hmm. Uh, once they like allegedly have had some funding, it was go time. And it was also like they were running up against the open cup, like registration window deadline. Mm-hmm. And I, he, uh, he called me, he was like, Hey, like, what do you think about Min Jay? And I was like, Min Jay's available. He's like, yeah, I, whatever. Like we can, we can make this happen. And I was like, do you know anything about him? And he's like, I remember playing against him, but like not, not really. And I was like, watch some tape, but call the agent first. Say, say you're going to take him. He's good. Take him. Uh, Minji's a 10. He's a winger. Uh, that's what I, I... Honestly, that's really what I thought he was. Um, he was really, really good for Syracuse. He was involved in a lot of their their good moments in attack. Him and Juan Luis. Good in possession. Um, loves... He, he's an incredibly energetic player. Uh, kind of direct, willing to run at you, willing to make you to make you miss. Very direct. Uh and, and incredibly fun. And I think provides a different look than some of our other wingers. Uh, the added element to Minjay's game is he spent the last year at Vancouver FC in, uh, in the Canadian Premier League. And he played pre- like some winger. It was about half the time at winger and half the time at outside back, both on the left and the right. I think it was actually more than half the time at left back and right back. I didn't look at the stats. I just went, went in talking to him. It's just the vibes. In talking with him at the bar, it seemed like he was saying that, like, oh, yeah, I was, I was mostly a right back and left back, it's, which I thought was wild. It's it's very possible that it, it was actually that. But, like, what I think that did, and, and there's there's been some some stats on, on the Twitterverse from, uh, uh, from the League One Review uh, that was profiling some free agent players uh, that they thought, like, might get into to League One or whatever. And he was one of them from mostly from an outside back perspective. Um, but also like he has all, all the all these other qualities. I say all that to mention like he's a winger. I think he's gonna be uh the kind of player that you can bring in off the bench, get a few starts, uh, you know, challenge obviously if he if he goes on an absolute tear, like he's gonna start starting, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh but one of the things that's really important, and I mentioned this during the outside back portion. If you have a situation where Jesse Williams is on international duty, Menje just played right back in Canadian Premier League, uh, and he has the qualities of a winger. He has the qualities of a ten. You know he won't play right back the same way that Jesse Williams does, but he will play it in the way. Like there's some flexibility with how Rod views position groups, and I think he provides you cover in that type of position. Um, 
So that make, do you want to start him? Do you want to like have him available off the bench to be able to play both positions? Like you have some options there. And I think that flexibility is, is really important for us. And I don't know. We'll see if it, if it gets used or not. Uh, but like having those characteristics is, is, is very, very good. And I think it's a large reason why he's here. Yeah. I'm very excited for Minjay. Strikers. Uh, so we have no foreign spots, as we can tell in our wingers, by the way, which is kind of wild. Um, strikers, we have a foreign spot for Medi, who we definitely need to talk, uh, I'm sure we'll spend some time on, and Carlos motherfucking Rivas, the former MLS player who uh, apparently has a green card now because we don't believe he occupies a foreign spot. Um, Matthew, let's talk about Medi, a guy who had um, very little to no tape uh, that you and I could find to watch. A guy who's played in Belgium in... Um, I was going off my memory, and then I figured I'd actually pull them up to make sure I didn't fuck this up. In Smart. Luxembourg, which, by the way, that might be the wildest one. Um, also in Belgium again. Um, in Belgium again. In... Um, so the Luxembourg, by the way, is the, might be the wildest one. In the Bulgarian second division and in the Croatian second. Just like a true journeyman at 24. Not that he can't make the jump, but like a lot of second and third division and like second rate leagues. And Rod goes and like plucks him out of, um, again, I mean, there's no disrespect, obscurity where we can barely find highlights of any kind. Like I think we found a couple like 15 second clips essentially. And now he's the like locked on starting guy. Like, tell me about Medi. Tell me about his game and uh, how you thinking about it. Medi is really fun uh, because when you have access to data and you have access to all the soccer being played across the world, you can get a really good idea if a player fits what you're trying to do. Uh, at least like meet certain KPIs and. Uh, and 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 is is maybe going to work. You never know, right? Especially with with a foreign player. Uh, we don't know if he had ever been to the United States before. Uh, we don't know how. You know, we don't know what his grasp of English was. At least I don't. Yet uh, there's a little bit. I I I've, I've spoken to him at the bar. Like I know there's a little bit, but like it's pretty decent. And you know why? Because a lot of, some of those countries, um, like don't speak the best um like anyway i'm sure he spoke french a lot but like croatia i don't think french was his go-to Maybe. that is an assumption and i could be wrong but like you just never you just never know how a player is yeah, going to settle correct. when they move to a foreign country to play soccer yeah totally and uh and, and so like and, and the and, second and division croatia does not in, scream in some respects all, all of these are bets yes. right like you're you're gambling a little bit uh what i what i saw in in his tape was a nine that likes to get in behind, uh, a nine that can play a little bit as a winger at times, like will flare out wide, uh, get into the channel. What I didn't see a lot of, and, and, and like uh, the overwhelming theme was like, oh yeah, this guy's pretty athletic, like you know, big guy, whatever. I didn't see a ton of back to goal play, and and I and I think, I think that's one of the things that we were looking for. And uh, this is why you don't have two podcasters essentially making, essentially making general manager decisions, even though, you know, all the data should be available so we can pretend to do so every now and then. Uh, but like game one, his, his one of his literal first actions on the field uh, when he subbed on against Huntsville was, you know, bringing down a ball uh, that was played from, I think, from the center back line. And, and like putting his back to goal, putting his back on a player uh, and trying to control to help us, you know, break pressure. Yeah. Little first thing. We've seen it a ton in his, uh, it, we've seen a ton in his limited time. You know, he, he played only maybe 10 minutes plus stoppage against, against Huntsville, played maybe 30 minutes against Miami, started against Cincinnati, went about 75, started against New York, went about 75. Uh can't wait to see what this guy's like with a preseason. Bulgaria was the other one. I forgot about English wise. Um, yeah. So I, 
I think the beautiful part, like you said, about having data is that they then could go use Scout and other things to get some video, which they clearly must have studied, because he does seem to, or four games in, but he does seem to have all the attributes that Rod wanted in, in the profile of, of a striker, a guy that can stretch the defense um, athletically, a guy that can also, of course, score goals, a guy that can drop a little deeper, do the hold-up play, and do the quick interchanges and technical stuff. Like, he, uh, I don't know how many goals he's going to score this year, but I have l- I think he's going to score a, a, quite a few. And I've loved how dangerous he is at all times in Absolutely. a myriad of different ways. And I think he is one of those just nailed on starters. Yeah. Um, Carlos Rivas. Uh, this is a fun one. This is a wild one. So this this player turned up. You know, you're watching the... Uh, Watching the second half of the Birmingham game, I, I was in a hotel room in Washington D.C. Players, I was in a pool in Mexico. Pl- player subs on in the second half, and I'm just like, "Who is, who is our, th- who is this right winger? This guy's pretty good. He's beating players. Yeah, and, and like, and we had struggled to to beat somebody off the dribble in that game yes. specifically in the first half, and so like, guy immediately does it. I, you know, I don't know who it is. I assume it's a trialist. It's like, oh, well, that was okay. That was that's, partially right. That's new. That's fun. Let's let's see how he, he played a really good game, and you know then if, if we we get to a, eventuality he signs and we're like oh holy shit Carlos Rivas like if you watched MLS in 2018 in in not just 2018 like 2015 2016 2017 yes. like in that stretch yes. like you saw Carlos Rivas like this is a guy who was transferred for like real money and I don't mean like whatever money we're throwing around like doing you know international transfers and or like this guy this guy was transferred for like a million and a half bucks or the fake gam tam we were talking about earlier i think he i think he probably had to have his contract bought down like this uh, he was he was transferred for real money and and played for orlando for a few years played for new york red bulls for for maybe a year or so um he uh, electric player and and for whatever reason, like his his path has taken some some interesting turns over the last few years. Now it's led him to here. He's twenty nine years old. Yeah, so he's still he's still got some good football left. He he's not he's not a back to goal nine, but I do think he's one of those like best available attackers that you just take. You know what I mean? So he got to Orlando in twenty fifteen, and he left Orlando in twenty eighteen. And was at Red Bulls for a little bit. Yeah, he is a no-brainer bet. And if we're we're guessing who the first <laughs> Toby, someone's feeling better. Um, if we're guessing the first player to get transferred off this roster. I think it's Carlos. I would if he has a nice little run here. It wouldn't be I wouldn't be shocked if he gets transferred midseason to uh, an MLS team who maybe parks him in MLS Next Pro with the opportunity to take him up and down on a real MLS deal potentially. That's kind of my uh, my hot take because he's he's been in MLS before. And if a team likes him and if he's playing well, like. Parking him in MLS Next Pro or just on the end of an MLS bench, and and having him be a contributor is is a, a an eventuality for a guy who just has minutes in MLS to prove that. Um, and I love that he might take up that challenge with us. Uh, one of my hot takes is on paper. I think that Carlos is going to end up as the starting right winger. That is a little hot take. I enjoy that. I think. He's going to be the best player without a seat in the musical chairs. And I think our right wing position is a little bit up in the air. And I think he's got a lot of experience and he's a goal scorer. And uh, I just think he might end up at right wing playing on the wing uh, quite a bit at some point in his uh, CFC tenure. Matthew, that is all of our players. Uh, give me your rating, uh, our you know, good, solid, bad, whatever for central midfield. How are you feeling? Good. I feel real good about that. I feel solid. I feel solid. Uh, once Jude gets bedded in, maybe I will feel great or whatever, but I feel solid. Wingers. Uh, I feel solid about the wing. We uh, agree. And, and the reason why I feel solid, as opposed to my goods in every other category, is uh, none of these... Hang on, who am I thinking of? We've got Taylor, Taylor Gray, Jesus, Damian, Jalen, and Minjay. You know, I I think 
I think in roster building, we were maybe hoping to like go get a, like a, 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 a and this is no disrespect to any, any of those guys, like a, a big, 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 big time winger, an Anatoly. Yeah, someone like at the wings, someone who like we've brought in from the outside, and like that's the guy, that's got a guy who could do some stuff for us. I agree, and that didn't happen, and and that's that's fine. That's that's no shot at anybody. Uh, so what we're what we're making a bet on is, um, uh, is that is that Taylor going up a level makes the jump that, um, one of the other guys that and makes that the jump. like Jesus. Uh, is able to make the jump that that Jalen James is able to make the jump. Uh, I wonder if Ella's home from work. I think she is. Uh, that uh, that Menje is able to also make the jump, and that Damien can yep. make the jump. And really, you need three of those guys to do it uh, realistically to have any any real shot at success. Yeah. Uh, on 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 the season. So we roll through solid about the wingers. If they start making the jump, I'll go to the great category real fast. Um, and then striker wise, if you had asked me six weeks ago, I would have been a very much iffy. Uh, but now I feel solid. Yeah, I feel pretty good about about. I feel somewhere between solid and good. If your scenario, because we're a little, we're a little thin. If your scenario about Carlos becoming playing a lot more minutes at wing becomes operative, I'll be a little nervous about about depth at the nine position. So here's what I am. I am. Because they're such different profiles of players, and while I think Carlos can do a job at the nine, he's not a nine. Um, he's like five foot eight, and like is going to do a very different hold up job. Um, I just I'm a little bit nervous about the depth, which is why I'm feeling solid instead of good. Sure. But like if our starters stay healthy, like I mean, good is, and then maybe great by the end of the season. Who knows? Um, all right, let's go to some mailbag. Um, we kind of talked really briefly about this, but uh, Victor, shout out. Uh, Vic, who's been on this podcast, said, how, how proud are you all the way night train Jonathan Burke has been carrying himself as a starting keeper? Yeah, good. I think he's done everything he's he's been asked. He's won a penalty shootout. Kept uh, a clean sheet. Kept a clean sheet. And I think he's overall played, played pretty well. So I feel good. Same. Uh, what's the timeline on Jude Arthur? Well, Tom Gonzalez, the good news is if you if you stalk him on Instagram a little bit, um, as we mentioned earlier, we can see he is not only in town, but appears to be in training. If those clips are to be believed, um, they are pretty from pretty far out. So there's always the opportunity that I'm crazy and that they're not CFC players. But Anatoly has a pretty specific gate, and I'm pretty sure that's uh, and, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure John Burke was in goal for that. So he is in town. I would be um, if prognostication wise, I would be pretty shocked if he started this week um and i would be pretty shocked if he didn't start next week at huntsville it's okay. kind of my my current thoughts assuming he got into practice uh this week on wednesday th- or today thursday or tomorrow friday i went i guess he, if he's got clips up they're probably from wednesday oh puppies <laughs> um w- Still only three games in. What's your take on MLS Next Pro so far? Is it tougher than you expected? Is it easier than you expected? Are you unsure, Matthew? Um, but are you just happy to, or uh, are you just happy to be in a stable league and not at risk of full? That is not a, okay. Let me rephrase this. Are or are you just happy to be in a stable league that is not at risk of folding tomorrow? From our uh, our acquaintance Next Pro news, uh, it's one hundred percent the latter. Uh. <laughs> It's a thousand percent the latter. <laughs> Just being honest. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a you you all a little peek behind the uh, curtain of Matthews and my text messages this week. Um, we have been uh, anxiously watching all the Nisa things because we're not involved, and and like um, the gossip queens that we are in this regard. Uh, I think when we were dating Nisa slash married to Nisa, it was a real pain. But now that Nisa's out fucking other people, like we just don't care. And it's wonderful television. Uh, it, it's really, it's, it's, I, I yeah, I, I borderline, I borderline love the drama now. Uh, what because Nisa, we're not involved. What Nisa is, is a shit show. And uh, their clubs are, are treating players terribly. Which is not cool. Which is, which is bad. Uh, I've said they should have been desanctioned already. Uh, that was back when we were still in it. Like, my views of that have not changed. I'm very happy to be out of it. I'm very happy that it does not affect us anymore. Um, but just like a hundred car pile up, you can't help but watch. 
<laughs> well said. Um, I will also go to the first part of this question. So three league games in, um, I am a few, I'm a few um, 90s and 30s behind. I watched every single 90 and 30 from the first week, and I watched about half of them from the second week, and I have not watched. I've watched like bits and pieces from there. Um, I will say, and I think I've said it on this podcast, but um, I'll repeat it in case I haven't. Um, the I am pleasantly surprised with the overall level from top to bottom um, in a good way. I think it's like the top end talent is really fucking good. Uh, it's just really young for the most part. And so um, I have seen some moments of absolute magic, including like that goal that Huntsville scored against us, where it's a back heel to a first time finish into the at a side netting, right? The finishing quality, if you watch these games, is so high in moments, not in every moment, but in many moments where you're like, God damn, like how did that, like that is an unbelievably high level play or finish in particular. Um, I think a lot of the defending in this league is naive um, and very young. Um, I think that bodes well for us with a, with the oldest roster in the league and a, and a, a roster that has a lot more pro experience. Um, and I think that um, I I watched the final from last year and I, and I apologize for repeating this. I don't remember if I said it, but like no... I watched the Columbus and um, Austin final from last year, the 50, 90 and 15. Sorry, I said 90 and 30 earlier. 90 and 15. And that is the highest level soccer game I've seen in MLS Next Pro so far from those two game, those two teams in that game. That was after a season long, right? But it was a culmination. It was a very good representation. Additionally, um, I have never seen us play as well as those two teams that played in our history. Um, so that told me where the level might get to this year. Um, which is means we've got a ways to go before we get to there. Um, but also I feel good based on that New York game. Something we talked about after the New York game is like we looked winded and it looked like, oh no, there's a quality advantage. And then as soon as we got fresh legs, we took um, charge of the game. Uh, is it tougher than I expected? No, because I, I really thought it would be 30, 30, and 30, 30% better than us or 30% like really good, 30% average, and then 30% not very good, like children. And I, while I don't think that has perfectly come out as true, I and there's talent on every team, there is still there is still enough youth and inexperience on some of these teams, and lack of seriousness from somehow some of these organizations have taken, and just lack of continuity. I watched the Red Bulls look like absolute world beaters. Red Bulls two rather look like world beaters, going to dominate the whole league, and then they they were like terrible like two games later. So like you you said that Red Bulls you you watched their first game and it was like completely awful. Uh, I, I think is where that it was, is where that comment. Came I think it was from. the opposite. I think it was like I watched their first game and then I saw them and they may have gotten results in the other games. But my point being is like the 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 difference in their performance. I watched Columbus who were like went to this crazy thriller with Huntsville, but were also terrible earlier on. Like there's been so much variance in in. Um, in overall like play like quality yeah. of performance overall that like. I don't know what quite to think other than this league skews young and it skews very talented. Um, and I also don't know at what point this season we may see more or less drop downs from MLS. I don't know. And I don't know if that's going to help them or not because I kind of think it won't. I kind of think it might because the individual skill will be higher, but I just don't know. And I think defensively it might help because one thing that has been really clear is that the attack, like I said earlier, the attacking, the finishing quality in particular at moments, not every moment, but in moments has been extremely, I mean, Watch, uh, watch Luis. What's his name? German guy from that went to Cal Baptist at um, uh, LAFC, LAFC too. So apologies for I can't remember his last name right this second. Luis Mueller. Um, he, some of his, the quality of his finishing is like holy fuck, and some of the other guys too. Um, and on the but on the other side, like you see some glaring misses and some ridiculously bad defending at times. And so yeah, it's been up and down. It's been interesting. I'm fascinated. I hope to catch up on all of those at some point when I have a day where I have like. Uh, genuinely like four hours where I'm not doing anything and instead of watching like the Masters, which is no, sh no shade anyone who's watching the Masters, but like my idea of a good afternoon would be to <laughs> sit there and click through those MLS games. I would like to catch up on some of these performances, but yeah, those are kind of my thoughts that are not super succinct bullet, port, uh, bullet uh, form, but those are kind of my thoughts on the league so far. I'll note that uh, with result last night against New York City FC2, Red Bulls 2 go atop the East. That makes sense to me. And by the way, they are the most talented team i have seen play so far in snippets some of their attacking talent dude is unfucking real because is a good player he's gonna be a in particular yeah so what they did to columbus was very rude and columbus also might be might be good one of the, so a, a friend of mine who um is a current fan of a usl team uh who, who? 
whose team used to be in NASL. Who was USL? Don't know. Uh, said that when the two teams were in USL, it would take a third of the season for them just to really figure out how to play together. And they would get better and better and better as the season went on. Mm. Uh, and, and, and like, you know, the, the point getting points off of them would get tougher overall as the season went on. Interesting. And, you know, I think that'll be something interesting to watch as we're like in the, in, in the league now uh, to, to your point about Austin and, and Columbus, like, playing a game that was just way more high level than we've ever seen dude because like very that, good that level is not what we've seen at the beginning part of this season no and that makes a lot of sense like some of those columbus players are are now with the first team two of the guys Bunch are starting those... with the first team and one guy's on the roster there's like three guys directly on that mls roster and like two guys are at rhode island fc a couple guys like one guy's at new mexico like guys also then moved on i think one went back to, to richmond maybe like you know Guys, guys have moved on already, uh, and so it's going to take time for some of these other players to get in to well, the swing of things to get like something you pointed out to me is that a lot of the really good players that maybe aren't going to make MLS because their ceiling aren't isn't quite as high out of MLS next out of MLS next pro last year and potentially potentially the year before I don't actually know I think you were talking about last year have gone to the USL Championship and are tearing it up yeah um, and that is interesting because it it, it goes to the um, Nisa was an incubator for teams, right? For better or for worse, like all the problems that we had with Nisa and fuck Nisa forever. Um, also, there's some that so Nisa stuff we should um, talk about, including that NYCFC broadcast. Um, the the that was an incubator for teams. Uh, MLS Next Pro does appear to genuinely be an incubator for players, yeah. In a way, a real reserve and developmental league should be. Obviously, there's some problems with us being in that league and whatever else. But put those aside for a second. The player development part of it really appears to be happening, and in a way that I was honestly skeptical of that was going to the skeptical that it was going to happen. And it really does appear to be happening. Um, I, and I hope it, I genuinely hope it continues because it is good for American soccer on the whole, um, whether it's the national team, but also just like for MLS for players in the whole rest of the pyramid, because you don't have the athletic bullshit currently athletic bullshit, kick the ball and run thing that happens throughout USL league one and and, 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 the and the championship to a certain extent. Like you have some guys trying to really play soccer and really develop and a lot of young talent at 18, 19 and 20 and 21 and 22 that are actually, it's really like 18 to 20 and then like 22 to 24 that are playing a lot. And yeah, there's a lot of good stuff happening in MLS next pro um, except for the font. That font sucks. That font does suck. And by my, the way, if you wanted this font sucks t-shirt, uh, check out the Chad Hooligan store. I think there's about two more days for it to be live. My my short answer to that question is basically I don't know yet. I don't I don't really know. I don't have a good feel after three games, especially like three games where you know we were missing in the, at least in the first couple, we we're probably missing six starters, maybe five starters. Like I just don't really know where where we are in comparison to the rest of the league. Uh, obviously we're sitting in, you know, fourth or fifth place right now uh, with a game in hand. Uh, we've gotten six out of nine points, which I really like. Um, and, and, Unbelievable and, 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 start. And in a situation where I did not really expect that at all. So I, I just don't, I just don't have a good enough read. And, you know, I, I don't know if, if like if our ceiling is at the top of the league if we're if other teams will if we'll start out higher than other teams and then their ceilings will become higher than ours later down the road you know i, I just don't know uh it's too early it's three games if i was looking at an xg table i wouldn't even look at it until seven ten. games in ten. Seven games in because ten. it's 25 percent of the season ten seven games in ten because it's 25 percent of the season ten and 10 games in the Premier League is 25% of the season, uh, or just a little over. So, like, ask me, in a, ask me in a month. Let's get through Let's get through April. Let's get through the beginning part of May. Uh, and, and let's see where we are then. Um, you know, we're going to play Miami twice in the next five or six weeks. Also, um, I thought Tacoma was great, and then they went out and got beat by somebody. Um, it happens. Like I, I just it it's a very up and down league currently. Yeah. 
like at, like you said, ask us in and, and it ten might, games, and it might remain that way. And, it, and if your if your friend's prediction, it might be that we get to like sixty percent of the season before teams are starting to be consistently their level. And and the next pro followers that are like really engaged, isn't that just you and me? Seem to think that the East is stronger than the West as well. I would have guessed the be, opposite. That's because interesting. There's, there's more. On they, one and a half weeks of me watching games, I, I, I would think have guessed I the think it's because there's just more older players in the East. Uh, the yeah, the Western teams did appear to skew very young. So, you know, does that does that affect things? You know, is that going to only be an MLS Next Pro Cup like issue? Like, I I, don't, I just don't know. So that's that's kind of where I am right now. Let's move on to the next one. Matthew, what is your favorite cheesecake flavor? Victor asks. I hate cheesecake. Boy, this is why, guys, I, we are ending this podcast now. Thank you. for. Uh, I cannot believe you just said that. Um, so cheesecake rules. It is the best cake. Um, it is the best. So my cousin, little cousin turned 16. My youngest cousin turned 16. And uh, we were at my aunt's house and my aunt and uncle's house rather and different aunt and uncle not his parents so the aunt and uncle threw a party uh his parents were also of course everybody was there for it anyway um they got three different kinds of cheesecake and first of all it was incredible um and cheesecake from cheesecake factory is actually good which shocked me because i hadn't had cheesecake factory in a really long time and i kind of built up an idea that it wasn't good um and r.i.p city cafe cheesecake is good um boys what are we doing puppies um fruit cheesecake flavors are the best all cheesecake is good. Fruit flavors are the best. And then I prefer the classic strawberry cheesecake. The classic basic strawberry cheesecake is the S tier for me. But any cheesecake that has, I mean, I think I, I had a blackberry cheesecake last week at the party I was just talking about. Uh, I think it was blackberry. Um, anyway, all fruit cheesecakes are good, are, are the, like the best version of that. But I would just take a classic like strawberry cheesecake for my, um, for my tastes. Um, Matthew, next one. Who do each of us, who do each of you, I'll ask this in the third person, who do each of you perceive as our biggest threats in the Eastern Conference? I'll take this one first, if you'd like. Um, I'm going to say Columbus, based on history, because they've got two straight trips to the finals, and regardless of whether they look good yet, um, that, and I know they lost their coach and whatever else, but they they have the pedigree of taking this league seriously and the history of taking this league seriously and i and they, i mean they even play in their own like their own little stadium right like they just I, I i respect where they're coming from and they i would put them at the top of that list um outside of that in the east um i think huntsville just fired their coach so all bets are off huntsville might actually be good they're pretty talented their coach is just a terrible coach budget harry kane um we will miss you um a little birdie told me that uh they will not be better after he left, but we'll see. Um, somebody, somebody who I know who's booked somebody inside of that team who doesn't think they will get better, <laughs> which is fucking hilarious, That's by the way. Really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know who spoke to who, but I, I know like who my who the person that I know is, but I don't know who they spoke to inside the organization. But uh, sounds like vibes are not high there, or at least among with that person, they were not high. Um, so I mean, I hope that they eat shit and never win again. Um, Outside of that, uh, I would say Red Bulls are are for the team that has impressed me the most, as I mentioned earlier. So I would say Columbus first, Red Bulls second, um, Huntsville third. Genuinely, and mostly because I really don't want Huntsville to win. And like the top end scoring talent on that Huntsville team with Bolaños, um, Forster, whatever his name is, and Sipic. Um, I don't I don't only know like one name of each of these three guys, but those three dudes are legitimately good attacking talent. And if those, if, if a coach figures out a way to put together a coherent squad that uses the three of them to their best ability, they could just score three goals every game between those three guys and be a real problem for everybody. And you didn't even mention a guy who uh, scored a bunch of goals for Forge in uh, the CPL the last few years, too. Who's that? Wubens. Oh, yeah, the guy. Yeah, I don't even know who that is. I've never watched that. I, I remember you mentioned his name um, at some point. But I, yeah, so, like, I, they're, they're an interesting one to watch, but like they'll have to prove it. You know so those are the top three in that order for me. Columbus or way too early power rankings for me that I'm scared of. Columbus first, New York Red Bulls second, Huntsville third. Not because and, and the Huntsville's parsing my heart. Like, I don't want Huntsville to have anything good. <laughs> Might say it's becoming a rivalry for you. So uh, I did say this to you earlier this week. I forgot about that. Um, my heart is got a little tingle for um, for Huntsville, meaning like the Michigan Stars became our one true rival, and they became that because of things that happened on the field. And the very first opening up with Huntsville, 
added just a little bit, playing at their place in the preseason, added just a little bit, them having some actual supporters. That's fun. That's really fun. It's fun and good. Them having a dope little stadium is fun and good. Um, us going there in a couple weeks and and there being a historic city rivalry between us and some soccer history between us. Look, they are a two team. And so they can't ever be like our one true rival because they're not authentic enough to be I'll that. I'll point out, and I'm going to regret saying this because it means we're going to lose uh, in, in a week and a couple days. Uh, but the last time we lost a, a team from Huntsville in a competitive fixture was 2009. Hell yeah. So um, you're welcome everybody for, you know, for jinxing us. Yes. So, but I will say like on the rivalry scare, if it, on the rivalry scare, if, on the rivalry scale, if the Michigan Stars are an 8 of 10 and Detroit City, when we were in the same league because of the animosity, were also like an 8 of 10 on the rivalry scale. Um, Huntsville, I, re- I reject your premise. Um, our one true rivals in Michigan Stars. Um, it's it's 6 of 10 for Detroit. It's 10 of 10 for Michigan Stars. Uh, but I, I will say that like the Huntsville, everyone is a 1 of 10 or a 0 of 10. Um, I'll, I would say Columbus is a one of ten. Everyone else is a zero of ten, except for Huntsville, which is a two of ten for me right now. <laughs> okay, there's just a little, there's just a little something there. Like, I, 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 and maybe it doesn't last, but like, yeah. I mean, listen, that big dude, that big striker, Forster, what's his name? Fucking put Anatoly on spin skates and almost scored. Like, we had a back and forth crazy game. They had some supporters. Like, you know, my, my cockles are warm. Oh, like, and we played two more times this year, both at their place. Like, it, and, could, it could be fun. And look, I absolutely despise that the league is trying to make us rivals, right? And it's working. But it might work out anyway. <laughs> I'm not, yeah. So, yeah, that's 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 where we are there. Um, so, who, are you, who do you think, Matthew, are our biggest threats in the Eastern Conference? So, I think I'm going to go. So I think I'm going to go in a different direction slightly because the way the schedule is formatted this year, it's not two games uh, or it's not like home and home with everybody, right? We play three games against the Southeastern teams. We play one or two games against kind of the Northeastern or, uh, or Midwest, the Northern, the Northern division teams. So if you look at Red Bulls two, who I think may be pretty decent, uh, certainly have a good start, 11 points out of 12 this season. Um, if you look at uh, you know, Columbus Crew 2, who I think will eventually get there, uh, although their their start has, was is not as good, um, they're still higher, <laughs> higher than us on the table. Uh, if you look at you know Philly, Philly Union 2, who's Ooh. ahead of us in the table. So if, if I'm talking from highlights, Philly Union is the best most impressive team in highlights. However, they're real young. They're super young. But they, like, as far as teams across the league that is most impressive, Houston's fun. Houston's actually electric because their attackers are, not all of them, they they have, like, but they have a couple attackers who are really fucking fast, really good one-on-one, and who do magic. They're, and their jerseys are bright orange. Yeah, that, Which, that on highlights, are fun. Um, and I forgot about Philly, so I'm glad you brought them up. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Philly has you know a guy that's allegedly going to manchester city and like all these other things like philly's fucking good i just don't know if they aren't too young to put it together philly uses their they, academy better than anybody in and they have right a resident they had a, one of the original residency programs which peter fuller helped start and whatever else so i will i will add to my list of top three teams they are the fourth team and they should maybe they should be um yeah i'll put those three above huntsville i'll put huntsville fourth and i'll put i'll put um First Columbus because of the history. Second Philly. Third Red Bulls. Fourth uh, Fourth Huntsville. Here's why neither of your top three matter. We play each of those teams once. I think that the three teams I just named. Actually, we play Columbus home in a way, I think. N- no. No, we only play Columbus home. Not away. Oh, we don't go away. That's a, that's sad. Yeah, because I was like, really looking forward to visiting okay, Scott. So, on, uh, so look at, so look at, you know, w- it's early. It's early days, right? Red Bulls two at the top, my Inter Miami two second. I just don't think Union, I don't third, think Inter Miami is going to last third. Uh, Columbus Crew two is fourth. Chicago Fire got a win against Crown Legacy. They moved ahead of us in the, in the table for for now. Only one of those teams is in our division. Crown Legacy. Crown Legacy is on like one point right now. It's Inter Miami two. It's oh, the I see only team in our division. So. 
Are they are they good? Are they just on a on a, on a good start? Ten Listen, points out of twelve. We took their best player. It's fine. <laughs> they dropped on Benjamin Kramaski, which is the reason they won the last game. Like, let's not pretend that they're that good. He's actually not the reason why they won the last game. Don't ruin my narrative with your facts. <laughs> Uh, so I, I guess my point is like I think that the teams that matter are going to be whichever teams in the Eastern Division or I'm sorry the Southern Division of the Eastern Conference are are the best teams in 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 that division. I think that's where it matters because we play those teams three times. We'll get Red Bulls once. We'll get Columbus once. We'll get Philadelphia once. We get Chicago Fire just once. Do they come home? I don't think they come home. No, we get Toronto twice i think we get new england revolution twice um and we get maybe new york city or is that just one uh i don't remember it's something like that so you know this game this weekend although only our fourth game in the league is is super important because we'll get inner miami too twice uh and both on the road their start's been pretty good are they going to be pretty good I don't know. Maybe. But that's why it's a big game this weekend, number one. Uh, and, and and why it matters that uh, that we take care of business. Is Orlando City B good? I don't know. Is Atlanta too good? I don't know. Is Huntsville good? So far, no. But Huntsville is they in my, to, Huntsville's they in have, my top five. Huntsville has the talent to like be good. I don't know why they've never been good. They have the top. That's probably a personal problem. <laughs> they have a top end. They have the top end talent. I don't know if they have the talent up and down, but I just with those three players, and I realize there's a fourth player that I haven't even like talked about. Like if they just figure out how to play coherent something that gets those guys chances, like I mean, they like, could be really good. Like your 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 could boy be. your boy Max like is is a decent player. Very I didn't young even player. Mention him. Very good player. Uh, his teammate at Fuego last year had uh, Cerritos had like, I don't know, 10 goals or something like his teammate last year at Fuego. Jesse Williams had um, some nice moments on our team. Now damn right. He is um, Matthew. I have the most fun question out of this entire group. Next, if we ever get a soccer specific stadium would the Chatta hooligans prefer um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take away um, Lee. I'm sorry. I'm gonna modify your question here, Math. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna modify it and make it just Matthew and I because we certainly do not speak for the entire chat of hooligans in this moment. Though I, I I think we might, I think we potentially might have a similar view to what they like the the masses would have. But I, I don't know because I never asked genuinely. Um, but if we ever got a soccer specific stadium, would we want to do the traditional soccer behind the goal supporter section, or would we want to stay behind the visitors bench? I don't like watching games as much behind a goal. It's fair. I don't know if that makes the most sense for a supporter section in an ideally built stadium. But I personally, as the resident match watcher. You're saying I don't watch the match? Since you've come up with me, we've watched a lot more of the match together because it's you uh, talking shit to me or me talking shit to you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. Uh, but like, I just don't. I I really I really like our spot, uh, and, and and I don't know. Maybe like if we ever do get a soccer specific stadium, like it'll probably be a while. Maybe I'm just old and so one of the things want to go sit in at, at, at you know fifty yard line anyway. One of the things that happens too is that your your um. In a smaller, let's say a four thousand seat, five well five thousand seat. Hopefully, it's like eight thousand seats. But let's say five thousand seat stadium, soccer specific stadium. A lot of times, your behind the bench gets built deeper because the smaller stand to build deeper, and then your long stands are all built like you know ten or fifteen or twenty rows deep instead of being like forty rows deep. And so I think like that's one of those like design things that makes it easier to be behind the goal. Um, I think you and I are on the same page because of history on my end. Um, and the sightlines are a little better because of history. I would rather be behind the visitors bench. Yeah. Um, that being said, I don't mind being behind the bench. Uh, I mean, behind the goal rather. I've done that a lot uh, traveling with the U.S. men's national team and U.S. women's national teams, and uh, I have grown accustomed to that in in a good way. I think that it's it is r- the the thing you miss from the good views you get in spades if your team scores in front of you. Yeah. It is fucking magical when the team scores right in front of you and they just take a couple steps 
past the goal and they're right there to you. Um, and so I would, I would enjoy that. Uh, I think my preference would be to kind of continue tradition, but honestly, whatever gave us a dedicated space. Also the thing about being on the end is potentially we could have more things we could do with flags, more things we could do with TIFO Absolutely. because you're blocking less views potentially. Um, so I, I would be willing to potentially give what up would, some of the history and whatever else. If I got to get other things, what would be better for the supporters is not necessarily what I would, what I would want for me personally. That's completely fair. Um, okay, I would like to go before we wrap this bad boy up, um, and we may have a couple more things, but it's uh, we're at two. We're I'm at, I'm happy to wrap this bad boy up. So whatever you got, let's do it now. Um, I would like to get your that so Nisa moment um, of the day, uh, of the week, of the so far of this podcast. Um, so the stars went the went full stars in the Open Cup, and I think their opponents uh, from MLS Next Pro uh, Minnesota had like, you know, 20 shots to their 10 and had like, you know, 65% possession to the Stars 35 and had like 20 touches in the box or some insane number and the Stars had eight. But the Stars did the thing the Stars always do. Or just convert all of those touches in the box to shots? And score. They scored in extra time. So it went 0-0 and it went to extra time. And they scored in extra time to make it 1-0. And then they scored again in extra time to make it 2-0 to win 2-0 when all the stats went against them. And guys, this is not like a fluke. They so like they just went full stars and it was beautiful. Um they have Sebastian Capazucci and Colin Stripling. Yep. Starting for them. Sebastian who is the perfect Michigan Star center back and I am proud of him and happy for him and I love it. Colin Stripling who is the best DM they've had in years and who was excellent in the part that I saw. I started watching um Full disclosure, like the 68th minute or so. Um, and I watched through the end. And then after the game, George did a mini press conference himself. Yeah. Which fucking ruled. <laughs> the vibes were excellent. He thanked the players that played. And I don't know if he meant to or didn't mean to, but definitely did not thank the players who didn't get to play, which was hilarious. If you didn't get on the field, you get no thanks from George. Um, his mustache was looking chef's kiss he then subsequently since then uh since they have drawn detroit city in the open cup he has taken control i mean i think he's always obviously he's always his twitter control but he hasn't been to my knowledge because maybe i'm just not on twitter enough but he hasn't been tweeting regularly in the first person and writing statements that he definitely just wrote and had somebody like put on the statement generator and, and place so uh, Dan Vaughn posted something on Twitter and then he responded to it with an official Michigan star statement, thanking Dan Vaughn for it was Dan Vaughn, right? Yeah. For whatever it was, which was so good. And then following that was a lot of nasty comments from Detroit city um, supporters, which is par for the course. And then he started responding and quote tweeting those responses and George having the keys back and the Twitter, I assume on his cell phone again is just so fucking good. They also won their first Nisa game, three to two, by scoring two goals in the in the last uh, two minutes of extra time. And look, the stars are fully back, baby. Steven Yunkai is back, which means Robert's not playing again ever. <laughs> and Marich is back. The Michigan stars are going to dominate Nisa. I think they are going to be really fun to watch from a distance. And I think while I hate them, we're not in the same league anymore. And with Capazucci and Colin going there, the the stars are kind of my Nisa team. Not that I'm like going to be actively like, oh, go stars, but like I'm going to want to know what happens. I'm going to want to occasionally tune in. And if I'm only going to watch one Nisa game, which I might watch more than one, that's the one I'm going to want to watch every week. And I'm going to be very, very interested to see uh, how our boys, Colin and uh, Capo, do. In, in Michigan and how this story develops because it's like the WWE wrote a storyline about uh, about this. It's so good. Uh, mine, that's so nice a moment, is speaking of Capo, uh, Capo FC is signing their players to $0 professional contracts. Allegedly. Uh, apparently Georgia Lions, well, Georgia Lions are now Georgia FC and are signing guys to like $300 a month contracts. Allegedly. Uh, with no housing. Allegedly. Uh, apparently Savannah cut down uh, and I actually care about this one because like Roddy Green's playing there, but cut down like their 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 salaries uh, from agreed upon contracts. Allegedly, uh, I'm just trying to save us from getting sued here. And 
Like shit's an absolute mess, and that feels par for the course. Also, it's par for the course for any league run team to have their paychecks be late, allegedly. And in, 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 Nisa. in Nisa, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. And have John Perucci not pay his bills, allegedly. Classic. Like, like this is this is just what happens. And Savannah's currently seeing that uh, Georgia Lions and or Georgia FC, whatever the fuck they're called now, and Fabian will probably experience that. I hope not, but. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to ignore the bad things that are going on in NISA, which are plenty, and they always are. And just focus and, on the absolute chaos until it no longer exists. Listen, I just need to see Bob and George in a full fist fight at the 50-yard line after a game on a rec field in L.A. Well, probably in like San Diego or some shit, wherever Bob's going to play. Honestly, with that image... Thanks for listening to two hours and 21 minutes of the, of the Section 109 podcast. Yeah, it'll cut off a little bit because we started recording early. But yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Check us out on YouTube. We love you. Peace.